Welcome back to Hoffman Tactical. Today we're doing another live stream. This one's going to be a little bit different. We have on a very special guest today, and we're going to be talking about a few different subjects that are some of them a little more off topic, some of them quite on topic. So rather than doing our standard uh, kind of CAD design, we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, cannons. Maybe we'll touch on the ghost gunner, a uh, little CNC machine a little bit, as well as other topics. So this should be quite interesting. And uh, if you guys have any questions throughout the show, by all means, I'll leave them here in the chat. I am scanning the chat, and uh, we'll try to answer questions uh, kind of in intervals as we go through. So I'm going to bring on our illustrious guest for today, and that is Mr. Snow. So everyone, welcome Mr. Snow to the stream. Howdy, fellas and ladies, I'm sure, that are out there hiding. All right. How has your evening been, Mr. Snow? Productful. It's been a lot of fun. Um I don't know if you saw, I'm sure you saw the clips I made earlier today of making that suppressor tool and some of the fast and dirty CAD ways of making irregular objects uh, to make useful tools. Yes, and I saw your suppressed takedown lever action in 357 subsonic. Uh, so it's in 357 Magnum, but I am I am shooting a 38 Special. So 38 Special is naturally subsonic. And I'm shooting 158 grain subsonic 38 special, and it's beautiful. I see. Yeah, it was a, a nice build for sure. I saw it had an interrupted thread, which it used to attach the uh, the barrel into the receiver, which I thought was also quite interesting. It's an underappreciated technique of joining things, in my opinion. Yeah, it's either really strong or they're fast. Um, I've got a couple interrupted thread uh suppressors as well that just you know quarter turn and they're good to go so they're super fast and strong and it's a really neat way of doing things yes for sure so i thought the first thing would be interesting to branch into would be uh the elephant in the room so to speak and that would be your cannon so you have a cannon what's kind of the history behind that where did it come from why did you get it and then we'll move into what it can do well, I got a cannon because Joe Biden said I couldn't have one. So as soon as Joe Biden did that press conference where, you know, you can't own a cannon, you can't have an automatic weapon, I went out and purchased a cannon immediately. Uh, also inspired, of course, by Bulligan Shooting Sports. He and I actually have the same cannon. That cannon came from Coaches Club Cannons, which I believe has been bought out by McLennan Cannon Company. So new Canon company now, uh, but you can buy that Canon, that tube portion for around, I think they're about $800 for the actual Canon portion, which is shipped directly to your door, USPS. And was it ready to go or did you have to do some lathe work on it to finish it up? No, so it's a muzzle loading black powder. It's not a firearm directly to the door. It didn't even need an adult signature. It was literally left on my front porch. Um, there's an unboxing video in my Odyssey that has a whole thing of like where it came from and, and, and some basics about it. And yeah, they're really cool. Then I had to build a carriage for it. You can buy a complete cannon with the carriage and the entire assembly. They sell golf ball cannons, billiard ball cannons, which is what I have. They also do bowling ball mortars. Um, and then they also can do custom cannons if you have the money for that. <laughs> Yeah, so do they do an A2 grip sized cannon? That may be in the future. I'm not going to lie. Now that I've got into 3D printing some accessories for the cannon, a uh, an A2 grip cannon may have to come into existence. I'm thinking like an A2 grip sabat. So like something where we can like load in, I don't know how many you could fit, maybe like three or four of them and then get them all probably out there about, at once. I, I would say about four. I think you could absolutely do a a2 cluster so just have a push disc down at the bottom shove you know whatever you shove in there is coming out of there basically so uh we can totally make that happen nice now another thing i was wondering oh go ahead well i was going to say we could also do some a2 bowling with the a2 grips downrange downrange put up you know 10 10 pin of uh, a2 grips and uh see if we can't sight it in on that with the with a recent modification of the red dot, I have no concept if it'll group or not. I I, I would be thrilled at like 10 MOA. I mean, I, 
<laughs> I'm curious myself. And for those of, no, I, of those of you who can't see that, I well, I can't make I can't see a change. There we go. So the photograph in our background here is uh, the forward end of Mr. Snow's cannon with a with a red dot and an O light attached. Yes, you've got to, you know, we had to charge it up there. Um, there is actually a method to that madness and the fact that that O-light has a laser on it. I see. Okay. So if I line up the laser and the red dot, I can kind of have a two reference point impact change. I see. Yes. The to, concept uh, of, of citing this in is going to be to have a sheet of plywood downrange, align the red dot in the laser, shoot a round, then I can leave realign the laser to that point and adjust the red dot to the point of impact. Theoretically, that would zero me if it's even possible. Yes, I would be interested, of course, in two things here would be the obviously the optics shifting would be something I would be concerned about to some degree, though that is a pretty beefy uh, mount you've got there. And then the other concern would just be it's smooth bore and um, the ball could go in any which way direction. And also simply the the loading. Uh, so each shot with a billiard ball is roughly about one and a half ounces of cannon black powder. So FG powder. That's a, that's a lot, lot of powder. <laughs> It is, yes. I think the the largest one I, I played around a little bit with with some little cannon type stuff uh, quite a few years ago at this point, and I used three quarter inch copper pipe, and it was uh, it was very small compared to this thing. Also fun, but uh, yeah, yeah, black powder is so much fun. Yeah. I, I don't think we uh, it's. I mean, is it a great thing to so, be using in a modern age? No, but I actually is... use the step down from black powder. I use the sugar powder. If you're familiar with that oh, at all. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's basically the same as, as like candy rocket fuel, um, yeah. sugar based rocket fuels. Uh, so it's exceedingly filthy, uh, to say the least yeah. and hydroscopic, but uh, I wanted to make a uh, gun cotton. So, which is something you could totally manufacture at home. It's kind of like a flash paper yep. cotton material. I and, tried uh, be that once and it was, I, I, I need to get into it more. I, I have the necessary materials. It's just, it can be dangerous working with, uh, you know, high concentration acids and such, but I had issues getting it to work. I don't, it seemed a little finicky, but yes, I, I have heard everywhere that it can certainly be done. And I would, I would like to see that happen. Yeah. I, I think a muzzle loading, you know, cause, cause once it's done properly, it is fairly stable. Mm -hmm. Um, once it's all dried out completely. Um, so I think a gun cotton muzzle loader hand cannon would be interesting. Yes. And this kind of, of course, ties into a little bit into some of the 37 millimeter stuff. Um, more of, you know, making like a pre-made cartridge with everything you need uh, for whatever you're, whatever you're building with black powder, I think is also interesting. Yeah. I mean, to sidestep on a uh, topic for a second, you know, we had Suckboy Tony with his electric um, ignition. I use the same kind of transformer step ups in that little gaddle prod thing that I once made. It's the exact same transformer. They're super cheap. You can take like nine volts up to about 400,000 volts. So your can is electrically ignited? No, but I think where I'm going with that is I think we could see some type of flash cotton electric ignition 37 millimeter would be I super see. doable. Yes, I see. Yes. So, um, and that's, I was also thinking about some of Tony's stuff as well when, when we were talking there. And I think I agree. I think it's quite interesting. And he's he's back working on that project again. So we should be seeing some more updates yeah, coming up here I, soon. I saw the V3 he's kind of coming out with now. Super excited about that. And But I think that electronic ignition is something we could do more. And I think it would especially play well in the 37 millimeter space. Because you've got so much room inside of those 37 millimeter shells to have a sparker, spark plug style ignition system would be pretty easy, actually, now that I think about it. Um. I don't know I why I haven't thought about that sooner. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And that's that's something which I I want to get into through ever I, ever since I shot, oh, I cannot I cannot think of anyone's name off, off the top of my head like that from uh it was uh 3D Arms brought his uh 37 millimeter mortar over, and that was developed by JP Guncat. That's it, JP. Um that was developed by JP. Ever since shooting that, I like very much want to build a 37 millimeter. So I'm I would like to do something that was a little different. So 
electric ignition would be really interesting for sure. Yeah, I think the NT79 is a great platform that's fast to build and interesting. Um, I think that's probably one of my favorites of it. Cron has some unique designs, some remixes of the NT79 has and has integrated some metal uh, backplates, uh, breach faces in them from Sin Cut Sin, which I think is a would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, the 37 millimeter world is quite interesting. And obviously where we're kind of li limited on a legal standpoint is projectiles, which is unfortunate, but hopefully someday that will change. Uh, yeah, it's a it's it, it's such a gray area on a lot of that stuff. It, it's rough. Uh, whether or not even our three D printed plastic balls are, you know, whether those are going to be kosher or not, we we just don't. I don't. There's a lot of opinions out there on that. Yes. Yeah. Um. For sure. So, uh, and not to change the subject here, but I thought I'd bring it in here. I, I wanted to say, nice hat. Um. I was going to compliment you on your on your fine headwear. I, you know, it is absolutely an homage to you. I, I, I absolutely adore it. And, and this one was actually a gift. So um, nice. This one's actually been embroidered for me. So ah, very nice. So it, it's taken off a little bit to where you know, as I'm losing all my hair, uh, this is going to be the future, I think, for me. So I, I fully approve. Well, and, you, you definitely turned me on to it, so uh, and, I'll stick with it. And I believe Invader Zip does as well. We have Invader Zip in the chat here, and uh, he approves as well. But yeah, so back on the topic of the cannon, how was the cannon manufactured? Just looking at it, it looks like it was machined. Um, now, obviously, yeah, so it, it, it started you know, its life as a three-inch round bar of 4140 steel. So 4140 steel, three-inch round bar. It was turned on on a lathe. Uh, it has the side uh, portions of a canyon that sit inside of the the mounts. I don't know the technical name the, for that. Those are welded on. The trunnions maybe on a cannon? I'm not sure. Sort of. Yeah, it's, the trunnion, I think, is what comes over the top of it, technically. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, but yes, that trunnion area certainly is welded on. And then, of course, just bored out to a two and a quarter inch bore. Then there is a pocket down at the bottom for the charge to sit. That's uh, I think about roughly one inch in diameter and about an inch and a quarter long. I actually have it all catted up. Um, and then it's got the fuse hole down the top. I see. Yeah. So I've been thinking it would be, of course, very interesting to have a cast cannon for maximum authenticity, but that's more difficult to, for a company to get involved in. Well, I think true authenticity would be a hollowed out log with uh with pipe hose clamps, you know, all the way around the log would be, of course. would be a valid option. Of course. Yes. And, and a little bit of, a little bit of fencing wire to give you some, uh, strength in your, in your, uh, longitudinal axis, axis, yeah. of course. Um, ho hollowed out logs were the very first cannons and mortars, I guess. Mortars, I think, uh, low pressure arms. Yes. Uh, but yeah, that, I think the, the cannons are quite interesting. I've just thought about as far as like, uh, the concept of like a century cannon is something I've thought about for years. And obviously there, there are issues there sometimes or, but just as, as an interesting experiment, having, you know, building like a weather tight cannon, which you can keep loaded, ready to go. And then when you want to deploy it, you can just roll it out and, and fire it uh, well, with electric. Ignition. So that goes, yeah. And that goes back to, I have thought about electric ignition on mine and, and I haven't implemented that, but it's, I've got some ideas for how it would be super doable actually um using that same method as suck boy tony so so the way it's... the way i did electric ignition on my cannon um way back when was i had externally a little basically a little flash pan out on the top of on the top and this was a cannon it was a three-quarter inch copper pipe uh with an end cap i think i actually epoxied it on and like a little block back there and it, it actually i I'd used one of those a, a sw i forget the name but the swinging pendulum basically you have a box with paper crumpled up in it and then you fire the projectile into the, the the box it captures the projectile all of the momentum the momentum is transferred i'm trying to think of the name there's a, it's a something pendulum but it's a way of of crudely uh it's a clever means of crudely measuring the projectile's velocity and i i use that this is way before i had a chronograph and i got the the energy when i calculated the weights and everything out was about the same as a 45 acp so it wasn't bad actually um yeah no they're 
there's a lot of energy there. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I, I had, I was just using copper gas line is what I was using rigid copper gas line. So it was very, very low pressure. Um, but the way I, the way I ignited it is I had, I just drilled a little hole on top and then I added a little copper cylinder, basically a flash pan. Then I just made a, a insulating, a little plastic plug. This is before we had a 3d printer as well. Unfortunately, that would have made it a lot easier. And then I just put two little electrodes on it and wrapped nichrome wire around them. And that way, or I think I actually used steel wool at the time. I think I, I think it was just steel wool I used. So, and, and you know, uh, suck, suck boy, Tony and I talked about this quite a bit and this method has lots of disadvantages if you want to have something where you have cartridges however just for a single shot device it actually was exceedingly reliable it was a bit of a pain to reload and i wouldn't want to have to like mass produce them out while i was making cartridges but for just a single shot cannon you'd basically just put a little sprinkle of powder into the little pan and then just seat the seat the wind the uh cap with the electrodes and the resistance windings whatever those are made out of carefully into the powder uh, the, of just very fine powder and in the case I was using fine sugar powder, but black powder would be the same. And then when you applied applied current through the um, through the the coil, it would heat up, uh, igniting the pow powder and uh, setting the cannon off. And it was really reliable. And it would be easy to make weather tight with just a little O ring in there where you'd kind of press it over a tube. So that's another option you, for kind of a then low you got tons of tons of off the shelf options just using you know um, rocket model rocket igniters and and little electric matches you know those would be super simple yeah exactly um yeah that would be even easier just a little flash pan to stick an igniter in there um and cover it up that would work as well well i mean uh, with the blast matches and things like that you can just drill down into your have a fuse hole like you do with a traditional cannon and just, and just place that down in? inside of your oh yeah. okay that's like practically off the shelf then yeah that's what i would do so even with like my cannon i could probably actually do that that would work pretty good. Absolutely. Think, but you do have to watch out because the amount of pressure that comes out of that fuse hole is pretty immense. Um, my kind of cocktail napkin math on my cannon shooting a billiard ball, uh, the billiard balls, I, if I recall, I think they're roughly like 2,500 grain projectiles. I think that's right. Um, traveling somewhere around... 1500 feet per second so it was something like 75 somewhere around like 70,000 foot pounds of energy that's just six times out of a, 50, a six 50 caliber rounds i think is equivalent to that then that's a lot it's a lot um I, of course i have that high speed footage of it hitting a level four body plate and, and it was breaking the two by four yeah the four by four behind it was just unbelievable the energy transfer on that four by four and even the plate had like probably two inches of depth formation in a ceramic coated steel plate uh it would have ruined your day for sure uh, and now of course there's the plastic billiard ball have you what is the most um authentic i don't know if that's the right word but what's the the densest ammunition you've fired through it so far so you know i haven't shot it a ton um, that's one of my problems. Like one of the things I, I adore about you, honestly, is your ability to like stick with in one or two projects. Like you're, you've been on AR 15s for so long and you're it's just difficult. Yeah. I, I can't do that. I I'm all over the place, which is a bit of a detriment because I'll start something, I'll finish it and I won't do documentation and I just move on to the next thing. And like, you know, somebody else can figure it out if they want. You know, I'll put the files out there and stuff like that, but I'm not big on like doing all the other stuff. Yeah, that's that that gets more more into kind of the, some different philosophies about development, and yeah, I mean, it, it takes a lot of time for sure, uh, and it's it can get pretty boring. So I fully under I fully understand your position. <laughs> um, once you get into those fine details, it's it's kind of you know it's more of repetitive uh, iteration, fixing stuff, tech checking rather than anything interesting and new. Occasionally, yeah. What, what I so. what I tell people is, I'm just chasing the dopamine at the moment. Like I will just, you know, hey, this is interesting. I'm going to chase that dopamine for a while. Then it kind of satisfies or dulls out, and I'll go somewhere else. Yep, um, I know the feeling very well. <laughs> um, yeah, I know the feeling very well. So, what do you think the potentials are of a do-it-yourself cannon? So that's something you know I I looked into a, a, a years back. Um, but it's not the simplest thing in the world by. I think it's possible. So 
like if you wanted to build your own from more readily available materials, how would you go about doing it? Well, it's it's going to be fairly expensive. I mean, I think if you could find the right piece of pipe already done, then just weld in a slug and a back plate would probably be the easiest way to do it. But I think it would take welding. There are some 3D printed uh, Canon designs out there that I've seen, you know, that never got fully fleshed out and released because it required welding um, to really to really make them. But yeah, if I was going to like try to make a simple Canon off the shelf, that's I, I would buy a nice thick pe thick walled piece of pipe, um, weld in a slug in the back as well as a cap and that's it. Yeah, I tend to agree because you can get you can get some pretty nice heavy walled pipe. Uh, and yeah, and I'd be I'd be seeking out you know your surplus metal dealers and you know people that sell by the pound scrap yards, and you could probably find something that would work uh, pretty readily available. Well, I don't think it'll be real cheap, and at that point you might as well you know for eight hundred bucks go buy yourself a, a nice billiard ball cannon and something you know is doesn't have any cracks on the interior Defects walls and or not inadvertently yeah. becoming a pipe bomb exactly yeah yeah that's that's some issues uh, so yeah I, I think i mentioned i haven't really fired anything other than pool balls i do have some cans i'm going to try out soon um we'll see how that works I, I asked because also way back when i i used to do some aluminum casting and I cast these little, I think they were about the size. I still have some around somewhere. Um, they're about the size of a billiard ball and they're solid aluminum spheres, basically. And they're relatively smooth. So I would be interested in seeing what one of those would do as opposed to something made of plastic because they're a bit denser. Uh, they're probably, I mean, aluminum is probably twice as dense as a billiard ball. I'm not sure exactly, uh, but it's probably about that. So I do have a smelter, uh, like a 10 kilogram smelter propane mm -hmm. downstairs that I have yet to fire up. Um, and that is on my list. My, my plan with that was I bought that smelter. The idea was I'm going to melt down a bunch of aluminum cans, which is not the best material for this, but melt down a bunch of aluminum cans and see if I can't make a billet for making an AR-15 and a ghost gunner. That's interesting. Um, that's what I used to do. I would melt down aluminum cans. Uh, the actually, you know, it's, it's around here somewhere. So the one part which I have made from aluminum cans was actually a bullet mold, uh, a custom yeah. bullet mold. Uh, it, this was a couple of years ago. I did a, I, I did. I think I might still have some videos on Odyssey about it actually. Uh, but I just used aluminum, and the only problem I had was there. The ca my castings were done in a wood furnace, and I didn't properly degas the aluminum. So there were lots of little pockets of probably hydrogen um but there was lots of little pockets in there so it's kind of a little bit bubbly it worked but keeping it de properly degassing would make a, a denser material that would probably be a little bit better but yeah i think that would yeah, be I've totally got, doable i've got a vacuum chamber that could actually handle the crucible um so we'll see how it goes i'm a little leery about some of that <laughs> that would be interesting yes um that would be interesting for sure i've been looking at some of the little um the little like basically, I think they're one, they're like two or two or three pound. The little electric melting furnaces you can get, little two hundred forty volt electric ones. Um, yeah. Just because, for because I'm more interested in doing little parts. Uh, you know, more like maybe safeties or something. But uh, small components in uh, in aluminum alloys or you know aluminum zinc copper alloys, non ferrous alloys. And I thought that would that would be very convenient to melt those uh, compared to propane. And I used to use wood which is quite, quite difficult, quite messy. So a little electric furnace would be quite handy uh, to do melting with. Uh, and yeah, it, it's once you have the equipment and you kind of understand the process, casting is, a, is an interesting process. It's not as easy as people think it is. I get lots of suggestions about casting parts and I'm always. Yeah, don't, don't an, we all. It's an awesome thing. However, it's not as simple as you think it is. But yeah, I would like to see more casting. I, I have seen... Uh, with the super safety, I have seen several people working on casting it, and that was interesting to see. And some of them got some actually decent results. So that was quite interesting to see as well. I mean, even with casting, you know, you're of course you got to account for the shrinkage of the part, which we can do that stuff. Um, you know, those those metal casting has been, been done for a very long time, and it's relatively consistent on part shrinkage. So you have to make your molds knowing that's going to happen, but you're always going to have to hand file and finish and machine and 
tumble and it's it's a lot of work for sure yeah it's it's tricky getting molds to fill properly and all of that i've, I've done like some urethane casting which a lot of the stuff is actually kind of it's like metal casting but easier because you're not dealing with super hot metal um and designing molds and, and deciding how you're going to and, and the metal casting coming up with molds can be even trickier but designing molds depending on your process can be a tricky uh process for sure but but you can get some really interesting results so I, it's it's uh it's a very interesting process now yeah, you I mentioned did, uh, oh, go ahead you're a thing casting for these vice jaws oh nice so this is a little portable vice jaw and um actually like 3d this these are actually tpu um that go down really really deep in this little small vice jaw it's great for like latching onto a barrel and putting it on the the, the bench these things are fantastic yeah um it's a it's a it's a good process so you mentioned the ghost gunner the ghost gunner and that is a small cnc mill for those who don't know and it's used it's been used to machine out like 80 percent receivers and such and then more recently we've got the i think the, there's the glock zero which is kind of like a uh, fire control unit type little chassis that drops into a Glock. And I think there's also the AR zero they're working on. So you've done some of this machining. What I've has done been, all those that you just mentioned? I, I think, I think you're probably the one I've seen them all from. This is how I know they exist. Cause I, I follow you and I see you make them. So how much have you done with that little machine? And what about machining like your own parts, doing your own cam and like fusion and, and figuring that out as well. So what's just kind of give us the rundown there. Yeah, so I mean, it, it is just a little small three-axis CNC machine. I don't think it, it's only really recently kind of come into its full potential uh, because they just recently, within the last eight months or so, unlocked the, the variable speed drive. So part of the problem was the old, the old software on the spindle to get full torque, you had to run it at full speed, which is 8,000 RPM. So that was bad. And you don't want to always be cutting everything at 8,000 RPM and your speeds and your feeds and all that kind of stuff. So they, they with their latest update, when you saw it go to the GG3S, mm -hmm. that's where they actually unlock the ability to do slower speeds with full torque of the spindle. So that's like super recent. And so that's where they're able to unlock the ability to cut steel, be able to slow down the spindle speed, but still have full power and actually cutting steel on this little tiny ghost gunner. So yeah, and we've got, um, I've got them downstairs. Uh, I've got tombstone plates where you can actually um, attach a plate of metal and then cut out like uh, the P90 bolt faces and things like that. That's, that's a completed project. There's some projects coming out right now from the Ghost Gunner that includes like finishing slides. You know, you can do RMR cuts uh, for optic cuts on like Glock slides and all kinds of stuff. It would be very capable of cutting, of making your own parts. Now, have, so have you done any of your own cam work in order to cut, do your own cuts? Not a ton. That's a totally different skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm in the process. I just got to circle back to it. You know, lost the dopamine on a uh, fully zero percent ten twenty two receiver in the Ghost Gunner. That would be that would be interesting. Um, yeah, that's so why you, you were working on that. Was that and is that like basically your own design, your own cam work on that? Okay, because you yeah, and that the, worked. You had that function. Yeah, all the, well, all the CAD is done. Uh, and I've done some 80%, like it was a process, you know, of learning, you, know, you got to deep dive, deep dive into the subject, you know, so I completely built out a 1022 from scratch with no 90 degree angles, constantly thinking about, you know, as you're designing it, what tool would be used to cut that radius in this space, because uh, a CN machine has a round tool, you don't mm -hmm. have any 90 degree angles that you're capable of yep. making. Uh, so I, I've done that. That that is kind of like been designed. It was released as well as a printable version, but I just got to go back and actually do the cam portion. But even there, more than just the cam portion, is trying to figure out what what stumped me was the fixturing. Yes, I was going to bring that up because 
figuring out oh there goes my camera on the half hour mark going to sleep um because with cnc machining so i have a lathe that's the only mach that's the only piece of equipment i have and we'll jump into that a little bit later as well uh but with i've looked at getting a mill probably like a precision matthews import mill and converting it to cnc uh or there's a company who actually sells them so completed so it's like a manual mill but you know it's cnc converted so they're relatively capable for little jobs but a big challenge i've seen just researching it is holding your workpiece for each cut and then making the changes that you have to flip it over you have to hold it properly and and it's it's a it's a challenging thing and for production use it can make it can make sense because you're um you have to make all your fixed stream, but then you're using it a lot. But just for doing one-off type parts, it's a lot harder than, you know, pressing a start button on a 3D printer. So, oh gosh, yeah, no, I, I would not. Dynamic. I would not do CNC for you know one-off and single-use parts. That's crazy um, because of the amount of work that goes into fixturing. So uh, we're downstairs in the machine shop area. So this is my Precision Matthews mill. That's a, a 949TV nice. knee mill. So how have you liked that? Like, is it, has it been a good machine? Oh, I adore it. Uh, I think, you know, for the money and what it is. And it's been fairly kitted out. Hold on. I'm going to flip myself over. Hope that was as fun for y'all as it was for me. Um you know, so we've got, you know, an air system for doing the the actual chuck down here for the R8 collets. You can take that in and out just by pressing a button and all three axes are powered. So, you know, we can just adjust these and it'll run, run the axis at whatever speed I want consistently. Power feed. That is nice. I've been happy with their lathe. And I mean, they're obviously they're Chinese made equipment, but uh, Precision Matthews, it depends. Seems to do, they seem to do a good job with making holding their producers to, to good quality standards. That's everything I read when I was researching purchasing one. And that's been my experience. The, the, the paint has not been the best, but everything about the machine has been solid. <laughs> no paint's going to last, uh, you know, against that kind of torture. So this is a precision Matthews lathe. Uh, this is a 1440 GT. Um, so precision Matthews does have a Chinese manufacturer and a Taiwan manufacturer. Both of these machines were made in Taiwan, and that was uh, selected by choice. So we were you we were able to upgraded version. That's nice. That's quite nice. Yeah. So we we went with the Taiwanese made machines. Um, so my dad and I do all this stuff together. You know. Um, so I'm gonna get myself on a stand here. So it's good times. So hold on, boys. There we go. Uh, but I mean, mostly my dad and I together, we do like bolt action stuff, you know, so there's, you know, a rifle that we'll buy the receiver, we'll buy blank and we'll actually turn and fit everything and really, really make nice stuff. Oh, fun. So truing up actions and stuff like that, that's, that's kind of where I really got into guns with long range bolt actions. That's interesting. Um, that's quite interesting, actually. So back and to, then there's the uh, ghost yeah, there, over there. There it is. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, I was gonna say there it is. So the the 1022 project is quite interesting. And how far into the 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 cam or jigging did you get? Uh my problem was I ran out of space in the ghost gunner. I'm off by about a half an inch. <laughs> so while the the piece itself, the actual receiver can fit in the build area of the ghost gunner by the time i add the fixturing i was outside of the build space i see yep yep it is so it i don't is remember small in there yeah it is quite small um here we can kind of go in for a look here i think um you can see kind of some of the fixturing that's inside of here is just these kind of little c clamp deals and while that's great for even an AR-15 receiver, barely fits in there. And but, but it will fit. Yeah. So that is yeah, and it's basically it was like it looks like it was almost designed just to mill out AR-15 receivers originally. Like that's about the size it is. No, totally. I mean, it's it's called the Ghost Gunner, and and while it it. I, 
it's it's the product is not actually in my opinion the product is not the actual cnc mill the product is the dd cut software that's like stupid simple that anybody can follow the bouncing ball press the picture do the fixturing like it's just a done process that's the product to me is the process being so simple not that it's a great cnc machine it's okay you know, it doesn't have cooling. It doesn't have a lot of features that you would want in a slightly more expensive machine. Yeah. So they, they it's kind of just been worked out. So it's trying to make a little bit more plug and play for producing a few standardized items. Yeah. Oh, Basically. I think, yes, totally. I do have another CNC machine that I bought used. It's a little three axis, uh, like two horsepower CNC machine. It works, but needs a lot of tender loving care to bring it back up to, to spec. And that's the CNC Baron machine. Yeah, that so that's a, a, yeah, that's exactly what it is. CNC Masters makes this Baron mill. Um, I bought this off of Facebook Marketplace for like $1,000. It's not for too much. That's a, that's a great deal for something that I can bring back to life and have some fun with. So I looked at that because I because I was very strongly considering getting one. The reason I didn't is at this I, I just don't have room in my shop for one right now. I mean, it's it's so small back here. I can't I don't can't really rational. I don't have a reason to have one at this time. Like if I need to get a part made for production, it's better off farming it out to one of our uh you know riptide rails or 80s rails or someone who knows what they're doing and, and can do it has all the equipment. But it would still be fun to have one to learn the process with and do all of that. So I was looking, and that's why after a lot of looking, I decided that Precision Matthews makes the best or provides the best just basic mills. So getting one of their mills and converting to CNC, and there's actually a company who does that. There's companies, several companies who sell the kits to do that. Uh, but the complexity I got into is just all of the stepper controllers and then figuring out the control software and then the cam side of things. It's quite a bit to figure out. So and at that point, you get into the territory of like, you know, I could for an extra 1500 2000 I could buy a Tormach or an MR1, but then you run back into space issues. Yeah. So, uh, and then, so there's Vol it's Vulcan. I'm going to look up Vulcan. I think it was Vulcan Machining. Um, there was a company, and, and I, I believe they're no longer, like, they're no longer doing it. It was the Vulcan CNC mill. It was a it was a startup, and they actually had a prototype that was quite interesting. Um, they were their goal, and I actually can't find them now. Let's see. There's lots of companies out there that you just use, like you know, off the shelf Mach Five controllers. Generally, well, what they is what, would, is, what this company was doing the reason it was interesting. Actually, I, I like they went like they went under. I guess like I could, this was a couple of years ago. Um, like I can't bring their website up now. Actually, what they were doing was completely from basically from scratch not not just cut not, not taking everybody else is basically taking a desktop bed mill and converting to cnc that's even what tormach does um that's basically what it's the end what they were doing is they were building a complete linear slides uh all custom cast iron parts um all tool changing all of that and their goal was to make it run on uh, a standard 240 volt uh outlet and that would be 240 volts at, at 30 amps or 24 amps, whatever, whatever, the, whatever it is on, on a standard breaker box. They wanted it to fit through a standard like 36 inch door. Um, they wanted it to be like, it was, I think it was going to be around like 20 grand uh, for the whole, which is not bad compared to stepping up, you know, for, for what it was, it wasn't, wasn't, and, and they never got an exact price on because they never went into production, but it was a really interesting thing. It was like a team of four guys working on it. But and I thought it was a really cool product. Which, and it was one reason I kind of didn't jump into it further at the time because I was kind of waiting for that to move along. But it didn't seem to go anywhere. Like they had a prototype. They probably still got videos on YouTube on if I had to dig them up. But it was a really interesting product. And I think there is a spot in the market for a product like that in between your basically converted bed mills or Tormach type mills and then Haas equipment, which yeah. when you jump into Haas, you jump right to like 30, 40 grand. Um, yeah, I've looked at a couple of used Haas machines, like a VF2 and stuff like that, but I wasn't ready to swallow the $50,000 yeah. project that that was going to be. Um, I, I toyed with the idea of starting to make some like 80% 1022s and stuff like that and selling them. And that was the only way I could justify 
you know, step it up. You, you really need to do some type of production work for, for that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, that, and that's why I think for like smaller shops or, or more dedicated hobbyists, it would be nice to have like an in-between mill in there. Something. So generally, generally the cheapest way you do it is kind of the path that you were talking about. You buy your bench top yeah. precision Matthews or Grizzly mm -hmm. makes a lot of really good options for that. And you can get yourself into a small bench top CNC without cooling and all that kind of stuff. Actually, like, you know, 3,500. Yeah. So that's about, so what I was looking like, like a fully, like a, a little bit larger equipment, um, all your accessories and everything, you probably looking around eight grand. If you want to get time cool, you, cooling, um, you want to get I mean, tooling's expensive, it's extremely expensive, you know, a, a proper, uh, spindle system with, with like, like you have with, a a quick change spindle, uh, all of that stuff. Yeah. It, it begins to add up, but it's still not horrible. It's under, 10 I mean, a, a decent, a decent vice. Like, you know, if you're going to get a really good vice, you're going to spend 800 to a thousand dollars just for a vice. Yep. Um, that stuff gets expensive. Um, collets are expensive. Uh, cutting tools is expensive. It's, it's all expensive to get. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of thing with lathes, but you know, lathes are, it's not as much. I don't think depends what you're getting, but, uh, well, I mean, all, all the manual stuff's going to be, and that's an interesting conversation actually, is that I think as, as people like manual lathes, like a bridge port, you can't hardly find those anymore because they're all clapped out and then scrapped. And then all of the modern machine shops are all going CNC. So there's, there's some weird voids and, in the market. Yes. But, and, and, but I feel like I have a manual lathe and I actually don't use it that much. I've made some parts on it, but it, it's just very time consuming to make a certain part, work out everything you want to cut it, make sure you have the cutting tools on hand you need. And then to actually cut it, you make one mistake along the way and it's over time to start over again. It's for me, it's been, and I've made actually, let me, uh, see where it, I'm gonna actually grab the the most co complex little part I've made. It's a little die. I think it was a fun little project. Let me. Yeah, go that. ahead. Yeah, I'm and gonna, it's I'm always... gonna make you large. Sure, so that go you ahead. Can take over the stream for a second. I'll I'll talk and and commiserate with people. I can't see chat, so sorry about that, guys. I'm just on my own here. It always seems to me to be like the last procedure that I screw stuff up on too, with the lathe because I'm tired. Like I'll get to the point to where I've been working on this part for like three hours and I've got one last process to do and I'm just ready to be done. So I start getting a little bit in a hurry and I'll ruin my part. Uh, predominantly the biggest thing that I use my lathe for is threading barrels and truing actions. And I do quite a bit of that. So. Yes. Threading is scary as well. Um, <laughs> I've done threading a few times on, on some large parts like four inch pipe. And um, I don't know, threading, threading is also a tricky process. Uh, so the part I was going to show you, this is actually for my new buffer band. So I don't actually have a ready-made example of the buffer band. They're all installed or, or broken, but the new buffer band is, this is, this is my AR9 lower. And you can see it has a, a, a band on there, much like a hose clamp, except this one is totally streamlined. There is no, anything there. It's just, there's a cover, but there's not, nothing protruding. So the way that works is there's a, a laser cut band from send, cut, send. And I have an example of it right here. You can see this one is a much, much earlier version and there's just a, a void. And then there's a screw, which pulls the band into the pocket, making the circumference longer and then tightening the band. It's, it's a pretty yeah. simple concept. The problem is, in practice, it's really hard to get that screw in because the threads catch on the edge of the band. So what I did to get around that, and it's still tricky, but it's a little more, it's now doable pretty easily before it was basically impossible. I made this little tool to, to kind of bend a radius on the edge of the hole. I don't even know the right term for that. I couldn't find any, it's basically making a countersink, but it's neatly radius. So I couldn't find anything about that online, any information on how or what that's called. So I made this little, this little tool right here. And basically it's got, whoops, what am I doing? Oh, there we go. Grab the wrong side. So this little tool is a, uh, it's got a few different diameters on it. It has some little radiuses. And then I have a, a pin, a three thirty seconds pin, press the end for alignment. 
And this inserts into the uh, other side of the die right here. And it traps the, it goes through the hole in the buffer band. So there's a piece of sheet metal in here. It goes through there. And then when it's pressed together on a press or, or hammered, it will then bend the appropriate radius and kind of neatly curl the edges over. And, and it's, it's worked decently for that. So this is, this is probably the most complex part I've made. I've used my lathe for other stuff, you know, threading, but as far as just cutting a precision component, this is probably the most complex and it's, it's not that complex is my whole point here. And this is the, this is the most complex one I've made. And, and this one was difficult because I have to cut the <laughs> radius. I had to cut a radius. You can't see it here, but there's a very precise radius, the size I want it right there. And in order to do that, I didn't have a, I can't buy a radius tool exactly the size I wanted. And I don't have a CNC lathe. So instead I had to, I laid out a stair step cutting a stair step cutting profile and I cut it one thousandths and like two thousandths and one thousandths at a time. And it worked actually quite well. Then I went over it with some uh, polishing paper and kind of cleaned it up to a perfect, cut those stair steps off to a perfect yep, radius. Yep. And it came out perfectly. Like I'm super we, happy with it's we, exactly the size I want it, but it took me a long <laughs> time to cut that, to lay it out just for one tiny radius on one little part. So the way I see it, if I was ever going to buy, well, let me refocus myself. If I was ever, ever going to buy a milling machine uh, or any other machining equipment other than just a, something for b drilling basic holes, um, like I have a drill press up in, it's up in the wood shop. Uh, I would always go CNC because I feel that the amount of skill, time and dedication needed to probably run a manual machine, I just don't have. And I'm not really it, it, in a position a to learn it. It, now, the other way, the faster way to do what you've described is, would have been to make a form tool. So you just grind out your own piece of high-speed steel that meets your – and then you just run it in and create your radius. So I, I've I've done that as well for cutting O-ring grooves. I had to cut an yeah. O-ring groove on the – I think I may have posted the picture up on, on Instagram somewhere. I cut an O-ring groove on the face of a brass part. And I, you can't buy the tool for the O-ring I needed and for the for the sizes. So I had to make a, a tool. But making tools is, is been tricky as well, getting all the angles right. And if you're cutting brass or aluminum, you can get away with it. And there we have a cutoff tool, it looks like. Yeah. So I had to do uh, – I recently made some firing pins for uh, Wild Arms Research for one of his projects in brass. Thankfully, it was brass, so I could get away with this much stick out in a mm -hmm. tool – but uh, that's one millimeter thick, and it had to go five millimeters deep. Yeah, that's 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 quite the overhang. Uh, there was a very large pucker factor on trying to make this one millimeter slot that's five millimeters deep in a tiny in a ten millimeter round piece of brass. Uh, not a lot of support on the machine. It was brutal. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just, it's that kind of thing. It just it's not a super straightforward process. All I can say is I love 3D printing. It makes you appreciate how simple it is and how approachable it is. Um, and you know, the fact that it doesn't cost tens of thousands of dollars to get into is just phenomenal. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so machining is awesome. I feel that a manual lathe has, has more usefulness over a CNC lathe than a manual mill would have over a, CNC mill, if that makes sense. So I feel like I would, I would, I would, if I was going to, the, the differences between manual and CNC for a lathe are less than they are for a mill, just because of the types of parts I would be making on them. On a lathe, I'm doing a lot of things like uh, just cutting something to a simple diameter or cutting threads, as you mentioned. And those are all processes which are relatively easy to do manually. But on a mill, everything I'd want to mill would have more complex profiles on it, which would be did, which would which really requires the, the way they used to do it is with copying machines, hydraulic copying yes. machines or mechanical copying, which you're not going to get. So actually on a lathe, <laughs> you can you can you can fake that. On a lathe, but on, on a mill. Yeah. On, on milling. Um yeah, so on a lathe, you can still get like taper attachments and stuff like that to uh and, and you can still cut you can cut tapers by offsetting your headstock or by using your uh your uh the rotation of your tool holder or something like that, your compound. All those things. I agree completely with what you're saying on a lay that is way easier to get away with stuff and, and recreate parts. Yeah. So that's why a manual mill is something I just, for at least for what I'm doing right now, I would only really buy one for drilling holes because 
one thing a manual mill is, is it's a really, really nice drill press. So, and, and yeah. nowadays it seems that there, there really aren't like, if I wanted to get a drill press, like I have a cheap drill press. Um, it's good for woodworking. It's about it. The runout's terrible on it. Um, I would probably just buy a cheap, um, just lower end, not lower end, but a cheaper model of a precision Matthews manual desktop mill. I would just use that because they have very low run out. You already have the, the, uh, X, Y table and it's, it's, it's good to go. But as far as buying a mill to do milling, I would always want to go CNC at this point and just, no, that makes sense. The process. I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't fight that at all. One bit. That makes sense to me. It's going to be a lot more useful of a, of a tool. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's something I'll be able to start uh, using and applying w without, with my, with my more limited skill set, without having to learn the machinist's way, uh, as much as I would have to with a manual mill. And that's predominantly, so the, the predominant use for my mill is, you know, I use it a lot for like tapping, um, scope mounts and making sure that all of my scope mounts are going to be properly sorted. <laughs> and uh, I, I use it a lot for making parts to set up fixturing on other things. You know, that's that's probably the pre predominant use of the mill is to make parts for other process, other machines. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of that in machining for sure. There's quite a, there's quite a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's not nearly as many people are into it as they are into 3D printing, and especially in this space, just because of the cost. And that's totally understandably. When you can get in a 3D yeah, printing the, for a couple hundred bucks and milling is is 10 times the cost, really. Yeah, or, or more. absolutely. Uh, I, I will say that the the hobbies mesh so well together, though. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the skills you pick up learning machining can give you an edge in the 3D printing space when it comes to just, you know, centering out parts and, and understanding how to set up your machine regarding how tight the belts are and making sure yeah. everything's are square. You know, that's one of the things I, I don't think enough people put emphasis on like squaring up their frame when it comes to like an Ender 3. Yep. I've, uh, I've not done a video on it because it was just too big of a topic, but I've, I went over it quite a bit on my machine and it was a huge issue actually uh having the frame not square your parts are coming out not square so that's a a big issue for sure especially on larger parts and you can fix a lot of that in software but you're you're fixing the problem in the wrong way i mean you can get there but it's never going to be as good as it should be or what it really should be i i, I think that's one thing that we just don't put enough emphasis in the community wise of putting a machine together properly doesn't get enough emphasis. Yeah. And making sure everything's there and square and all of that for sure. I, I agree. So this ties into uh, another subject. I'm trying to see what I was going on about. And that is talking about 3d printing. That is the Voron. So you did build a Voron and your experience was, was not the best as I recall. So like, where did that go and what were the issues that you had? I can visualize the issues that I would have if I did it, but what kind of problems, what kind of, what, what so sound the Voron, experience? So I, I built a Voron 2.4 in um, 300 millimeter cubic build space, all enclosed. You know, they run an Arduino the and, you know, running Clipper and it's, it's a beast of you know your your computer knowledge has to be pretty deep to get into the vorons that would be my fan... issue that's what i that, that would be my problem right there yeah it's the, a fantastic machine um and my first job out of college ages ago um i was a computer network admin so i had i do have quite a bit of computer experience uh but it's been a while uh, i work in finance now so it was uh it was a lot and you know i've got like right now it's sitting idle uh sitting next to a bamboo x1c um and i never use the voron hardly anymore because the bamboo's there and you know the bamboo is just an appliance <laughs> yeah it just works um so and i've also got a prusa mark 3s uh, that i used for forever uh, before, you know, really kind of getting the bamboo. 
and right now, like the, one of my linear rails on the Voron is a, it's got a hitch in it. So it just, it just loses in, you know, fall, you know, loses its steps on the motor and the belts are fully tensioned. I need to bring it back to life. But then, you know, I look at the bamboo and I'm like, it just works. Yep, for sure. That's, that's kind of how I've seen it as well. Um, though, I, I mean, it's a very, I like the way it's designed. I like a lot of its features. I feel like it, it needs to be almost needs to be a product. Like the, the Voron 2.4 needs to be an off the shelf product, which. So they have the, the Tragoon, I think it is, uh, is a product that's all based on Voron stuff. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if that's quite the right name for it. So there are some Voron products, but the actual Voron itself was never intended to be yeah. a product. Which, you know, so for those who don't know, the Voron was a project taken on by engineers that basically said, if we were going to build the 3D printer product of our dreams, what would we build? They open sourced the whole thing. And that's actually part of the problem is that there's so many different, since it's open source, there's so many different paths and ways to jump down. that It adds, it, it adds complexity and and makes it difficult to, to make decisions and you can get lost in those in those different trails and threads of what mod you want to put in there and who's doing this way and that way and it, it gets really really daunting so it's not a product um so it's not as clean and refined but they're amazing so so i agree with you so the the way that i break down this problem the way i describe it is and this is a little bit tongue in cheek when I say this, if you want your hobby to be 3D printers, the Voron is fantastic. Creality machines are fantastic. If you want your hobby to be 3D printing, buy a Prusa or buy a Bamboo. Yep, I, I agree. And that's why, I, I mean, I have I have four Prusas and one Bamboo. And I have I have used uh, several other lower end Chinese printers, and neither of them are currently running because because of that very reason right there. So I have like four Creality machines sitting in boxes that I just can't even be bothered to like look at. I just don't even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's I, I don't like fiddling with with three D printers. I've done that a little bit. It can be interesting, but I have other projects I need to work on. So. Uh, I for sure. Yeah, I, I have analogy. a CR10 that probably deserves to be shot with a cannon at this point. Um, I, I heard they had that reputation. Um, I have a Sovol SV06, which I'm actually looking at converting to a, a basic uh, uh, EDM cutting machine using the Rack Robotics power supply, which I have on the shelf over here. I need to I need to start working that project. So that will be an interesting project as well. Yeah, ECM is something I would like to get into and, and want to do. And I've uh, I've got some rifling buttons that that's another thing I want to try to do. Um, that's on my to do list. Yeah, that what so kind of along the along the line of rifling, what I would be interested in doing is trying to make some sort of very basic uh, bolt and uh, bolt you know lockup system, something that would be relatively easy to make with a manual lathe. And either some grinding or or mill or maybe some broaching or something. I think it could be done. Like something. There's a guy on YouTube. Um, I'm actually gonna. I will build. I think bring up his channel. It's called. Um, he he does some quite interesting work. And um, his channel name is. And this is kind of like along the lines of what I've been thinking about. Uh, it's Garage Guy three zero zero six, and he builds. He builds guns. He builds basic bolt action guns. Uh, he builds some bolt action pistols and it's all very basic, but they work quite well. And I, I, the way he, he uses manual equipment for everything and it all works quite well. So I think that would be an interesting project trying to make a, I was thinking a 50 caliber, um, try to make the lockup for a 50 caliber. It always seems to go back there for some reason, mm -hmm. that, you know, well, because we can buy everything else so easily. And that's something that for a lot of people are still pretty expensive. So, um, yeah, fifty caliber is a barrier to entry there. Um, yeah, for to sure. To get into it, because um, I think on the cheaper end, you've still got the RN fifty from Serbu. That's I think that's about the cheapest way. I guess yeah, no, I think that is still the cheapest way to get into the fifty cal is the RN fifty when you can get them, um, or the other one that's there is that three D printed. I can't remember the upper. 
for it's the, the 3D one printed that 50. 3D Arms did it, and I can't think of yeah. it either. But he, you can get the the bolt action single shot. There's a mag fit option, I think, too. Upper receivers, you can get them for under two grand, and then you can print your own lower for them, and uh, you're you're ready to go. So yeah, those are quite interesting. Now let's see what subjects have we not touched on here. There was a couple I mentioned earlier. I can think of one we need to touch on. I think at this point we should scan through some of the comments here and just answer any ones we might have. I think they might bring up something interesting. So I have eight of them starred. Uh, the original one was from EL, and it was in reference to people making jewelry using centrifugal casting for consistency. And it works especially well for small casting. So this goes back to the whole metal casting thing, um, which obviously we, we moved away from. But I did want to touch on this, and that is this is investment casting. So it's uh, kind of like lost wax casting is what I think people probably know, know it of as a more common name. And um, the issue you run into is getting the metal actually to fill all the voids in the mold. So centrifugal casting is where you spin the mold around in a circle on a little spring loaded spinner and, and it forces the metal to the outside. I personally don't care for the idea of that for obvious reasons. I, I know they do it. It's totally a thing, but I, I don't. It's a, I mean, it's a spray machine ready to go at any moment. I think the sprinkler of the sprinkler of pain. I uh, think you're <laughs> visualizing the same thing I am. Uh, so uh, another a method which is uh, also quite common and works quite well is, use, is vacuum investment casting. So you use a vacuum to basically pull the metal into a semi-porous uh, casting medium. Um, that casting medium is actually pretty expensive. So that is a downside of it. But basically, um, it, 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 uses a, it uses a vacuum to pull the metal, to kind of suck the metal into the mold. And it works quite well. And that's what I would like to get into. I already have the vacuum equipment. I just need to get... Really, it comes down to a, like a small heat treating oven that can get up hot enough to melt metal and preheat and burn out and all of that stuff. So it, it's definitely interesting. Uh, definitely interesting. Uh, along the same lines, uh, Fortenberg, Fortenberg says, I have experimented with aluminum can melting and made a little block. I could cut it open and see what it looks like. Um, looks like it is a little over one pound. For sure. Yeah, it's, it's quite satisfying melting down scrap metal and then casting it into a crude block and then machining it into like a precision shiny part and like polishing it up. It is, it is quite satisfying for sure. It's, it's, it's a fun. That was thing. something I did recently with my eight year old son is we like, we just turned down a rod on the lathe and made it really shiny and high polished finish. And then we went home and he fired up. Like we, I, I'm teaching them Tinkercad is a great way just to do basic shapes and things like that. And we made a stand for his little metallic rod and, he, he oh, loved nice. it. Yeah, so. it's, it's 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 a lot of fun uh, doing that shiny stuff. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, everybody likes shiny it up on the buffing wheel, and you know he was yeah. just. I mean, for an eight year old, he was in heaven. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I believe it. Um, now, Invader Zip, oh, who we had in the chat earlier, uh, says anyone have experience with Polymaker Polycast? Um, and he says SLA. Poly so the Polycast is a filament used in uh, FDM printing. So I have not used it. But basically, it's used for the pro a similar process that we're talking about right now for lost wax type investment type casting, where you want to do a while you where you want to use the three D printed part as a form to pour your investment around, and then you burn out the three D printed part. And the polycast is, as far as I know, it has it's has two properties. One, it burns out really well, and then two. I believe it's smoothed with alcohol or I might be mixing that up with something. So you can like smooth it and make a really smooth metal part. I'm pretty sure, but I, I haven't used it. What I have used um, is as I've used the poly, the polymaker poly smooth, which is very similar and it, it, it smooths with alcohol. Um, it's, I think, I think it's, I think it's PVA based. So kind of like glue stick. And I've used that when doing uh, urethane casting. So I used a 3d printed part, to then form a silicone mold, and then the silicone mold is used to form the urethane part. So it's an interesting process, but I haven't actually used the polycast. And I think they do have some resin-based casting. Yep. Obviously, we know they do wax casting kind of equivalents for, for resin-based. Yep. Um, I've never gotten into heavily into resin. I've got a small resin machine, but like it was always for me like an instant headache like my i was just really it's it's a it's kind of it's it's can be pretty nasty um 
Yeah. The urethane, so, which is what I was working with, the urethane's not nearly as bad as some of the resins. Uh, like as a, yeah, as a some lot people of it doesn't bother. And like even with like I wear a gas mask with like, you know, sea burn level kind of stuff. And like as soon as I take it off, like if I'm even around it, I'll just get an instant headache. I'm this just is, super you're, you're talking about resin printing here. I was thinking resin porn for some reason. You're talking about resin printing. Yeah, no, resin printing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I so fully agree. Yeah, I, I have a resin printer. I haven't used it. I used it to, I got it. I did everything I need to to print an air lower just to satisfy demand so I could say, hey, I've done it. And then what in the shelf? I took it out earlier this year or late last year in order to print a part I needed to hold a vacuum. It had to be airtight so I couldn't use FDM. And after that, it did that, put it away again just because it's my, it's, I don't like it at all. It's just, the parts feel wrong. The parts feel like wet sponge. Like the parts are always a little soft. It smells absolutely terrible. It's sticky. It's messy. I don't have much good to say about it to be, I mean, I understand why it exists and some of the parts are pretty detailed for sure. For yeah, sure. I, I, I totally have a desire to make some, you know, nerd, my nerd side's going to come out. I'm going to make some, you know, D and D figures and stuff like that with them and, it's you know, but it's just like I oh, would personally brutal. install the 0.15 millimeter nozzle on my Prusa and just wait yeah. the 60 hours for the part to finish. That's, in most that's cases, fair. that's what I would do. And that's what actually I, I actually have done that. So yeah, I have a bunch of like nozzle. That I got a whole array of nozzles for the bamboo that I need to try out. Like a whole nozzle hot end is super affordable. They're like 35 bucks for the. Yeah, that's one thing I've been super like impressed. That. Back to the bamboos is like the parts have been super reasonable on yeah reasons. so far but yeah they've been good yeah. i've had lots of issues with nozzles jamming actually and um it's i i don't know exactly what it is but it has been nice being able to easily change the parts afterwards I, I, and it's a very quick you can do a very very quick swap between different nozzle sizes and all of that it's almost like a quick change hot end which has been super cool yeah, no, that's that's the. I've had some brutal failures on the bamboo that caused a need for necessitated a complete replacement of the hot end. Did your camera fail? You put me in full screen again. Uh, um, I'm I'm going to have it back up in a second. It'll be gotcha. Okay, you're grabbing stuff and doing things and behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, it's, let's see. I should be able to go. My most recent thing, while you're looking for some, uh, there has been the the fiber laser. Um, that's been a whole new realm for me that I've been enjoying. Yeah. So tell us about that a little bit, and then I'll go through the last five comments we have here. Um, and I'll see if there's uh, any more come so up. So this is a 50 watt, uh, fiber laser and you can mark stuff. You can, it's really for metal. So it's for engraving into metal. I don't know that I have any fantastic examples. I bought it particularly for. Uh, marking barrels for chamber indicators indication. I didn't like the way that my stamps were coming out. Like it felt really bad to make these super nice high end rifles smash and then them. try to, yeah, and then try to like punch the stamp uh, a yep. chamber indication. Yeah. Um, so this is like in just like raw aluminum. Oh, nice. And um, so what what is a fiber laser exactly? And like how does it because we, we all know what like a regular laser is, but a fiber laser somehow uh, focuses this light so it only cut, cuts a, like a shallow amount. It cuts like a little engraving in it. How exactly does that work? Like is there multiple so, lasers that, that accumulate on one point or? So down here, no, there's just one laser. So down here is the driver. It's about the size of a PC case. And inside of there, it comes up. There's a fiber optic line that comes up to this Galvo head that's got a little mirror in there that it bounces the laser off down into the build plate and you can you know you have to set your z height focus based on the lens that you're using inside of here and it's a whole thing interesting i see so it, it actually directs the light through a like a fiber optic passage correct oh that's interesting yep and then there's a mirror head inside of here that that redirects that light down through a focusing lens you can buy different lenses that that adjust, you know, how intense that laser is and what your work area is. The smaller your work area is, the more intense and powerful the laser is, and it's uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, for sure, it's it's uh, an interesting thing. I've been tempted by some little laser cutters to cut balsa wood for airship models, but um, 
So you'd want like a CO2 laser to be really kind of the way to go. Yeah. So not, not, this is more engraving. So yeah, something just for, just for cutting um, for sure would be interesting. Um, So 40 ounce says that uh, he just got here. This was earlier in the stream. He says electronic ignition has been in, in, in in the works Um, talk with your launcher people. So he says that some of the launcher guys are working with electronic ignition currently. So that would be interesting. Um, if anybody knows any details on that, do let us know in the comments. I'm not sure who that is. I'm but... probably in the chat room. There's a uh, there's a launcher chat room on Matrix that's I probably need to check in there a little bit more. Oh, okay, yes. Pro- it's probably they probably have something over there. Uh Boo Poo says a PEX like band. This is back to the whole buffer band on the AR receiver. He says a PEX like band with a crimp tool or an axial boot style band would be less noticeable than the host clamp. They most likely need to be cut off for removal, though. So I have evaluated all of the clamping options in depth. And I can assure you if one of them would have worked compared to a hose clamp, you know, an off-the-shelf option, I would have moved to it. So there there are significant issues with, with all of these bands, uh, either being too heavy to conform to the buffer tower, not being available in the appropriate widths or sizes, or in the case of PEX bands, once you crimp a pe- crimp a pex band you actually have a sharp little metal tab that sticks out which is smaller than a hose clamp screw but it's more difficult to cover up and quite unpleasant actually so and and that's aside from trying to get one in the right size and needing a a, a little 20 dollar crimping tool to crimp it on so hose clamps are something special and we should all should appreciate them more um, they're, they're, they're just under- so ubiquitous and cool in the fact that you can get them everywhere and it makes, it's become a point of branding. It, yes. And, 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 and they also just work. I use them for a reason. They're really very clever. They're for, for what they are. They're actually a, quite a complex little clever assembly. Um, they're very cheap. Um, uh, they're very durable and, um, super easy to, they have, they have, there's a reason I use them. Uh, they're, they're really cool. Now, they aren't streamlined, which is why we are doing the whole custom band thing so we can get it streamlined. And, and I'll admit that any day, more streamlined is better for, uh, for sure. So that's to address that the crimp. I get, have gotten more suggestions than I could tell you on different bands. And they're all for the same three bands out there. And um, my reply is, is you know, usually usually the same. And, you know, back in the day, I, I would, oh, that's cool. I'll try that. And I, and I have I have tried. I have tried them. So. That is my answer to to the to the host clap people. Um, so I, I've I've only ever built one Hoffman lower. I built it and I harvested a deer with it and I put it back up on the shelf in a place of honor and it's still sitting up there. So that's the seven six two build, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I did a seven six two by thirty nine build with one of your regular old like V two maybe. Yeah, version two long time, time ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was still the super lower. That was that was the vintage. I, I needed though. So here's the terrible part. My really early lower files were designed on a different computer. And like I don't I I think I have the files backed up somewhere, but I actually and I had them hosted on a website, which I no longer have. So I actually don't have the the design files for my original, my very, very original lowers, like before host clamps, back when we were printing them at an angle. This is way back. Um I don't have the file because I so want to do like a video talking about my original one and try reprinting it and see how it holds up, all of that. But I it belongs I wanted, in a museum. <laughs> I that's how I feel, but I actually lost the files and nobody knows where they are. So I need to find them. That's kind of sad. So anybody working anything out there, try to plan out your file management system early rather than later. Um or just don't to- care. <laughs> I don't know. I have to be careful to keep track of all my stuff. I, file management is one of those things no one ever talks about. Like n- no one ever talks about it. There's there's no videos on YouTube about how to do it properly. I just never seen it discussed. Like how do you manage photographs, for an example, in a way that makes them easy to find? It's not easy to do. Um, I have no, a system which kind of works, but it's a tricky thing. So I I've worked out a system for my SolidWorks designs, which, which works quite well, actually, you know, a conversioning system and all of that. But, um, it took me a long time to figure that out. Took me, took me several years. So we have another comment here from Jordan Horst, who says any thoughts about using forged carbon fiber for making 3d parts and frame. It can be done with 3d printed molds and is pretty cheap. So a little context here for those watching 
forged carbon fiber is a uh, resin is where you mix resin with carbon fiber and then you form it to shape inside of a mold. And it's different. It's not really casting. The reason they call it forging is because you're not pouring a, a, a parts into the mold. You kind of pack the mold and then you uh, kind of make a sandwich. And that's because it's, it's a composite with a lot of large fibers in it. So the reason this is popular is because a company came out with a product a couple years back, did a video that happened to get a lot of views. And I've been getting contacted about this ever since. I don't disregard. I think it's a super interesting process and it, it definitely has a place um, for some part. So what are your thoughts on this, Mr. Snow? Yeah, I think it's it's totally doable, uh, but you've got some pretty big issues when you get to doing complex things like if you were going to try to cast a Glock frame, you know, making hollow parts or any kind of those features in in that compressive force resin with details is super difficult. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of basically my position on it. I think it would be cool for, for some parts for sure, but it's, it's kind of like metal casting. It's another one of those processes. Mold design is not a straightforward process. It's not a click and print thing like 3d printing. So good process. It has its application. However, it's going to take something to get into it and start making, start making good parts for solid parts like arms and levers. Fantastic. I think mm -hmm. you could make a lovely uh, magazine catch out of forged carbon fiber it would be fantastic. Um, um, you know, I think so. I think it would be, I think it would be pretty straightforward. I'm trying to think of like, maybe like an AR nine ejector, maybe. Um, totally. That would work. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I've even done a lot of, ejectors just out of 3d printed plastic um and i've had they've gone for way longer than i would have ever expected yeah i mean i on my on my ar9 i just print them and the, the pla yeah. ones hold up just fine and and the nylon ones i've never had any issues with whatsoever and i think they would last indefinitely because the forces are un, unless you have a, a bad malfunction that causes an issue um yeah the forces you just have are to be so careful with nylon with a layer adhesion based on the fill so yes um, yes, that's very true. I have actually used unfilled nylons for them in the past, but I think that, I think that the layer orientation that I use is pretty good. And as long as you have decent layer, had decent layer adhesion and you don't have splitting problems early on, you're probably good, but it's, it is true. a part where forged carbon fiber or forged glass fiber, uh, you know, with, with a resin, I think we'd be totally excel in that space. I believe for sure. Too. But as far as trying to do like an AR lower, that's a big job designing designing that th that mold system. That's not an insignificant task for sure. So now where so just to go on a little bit deeper on that, something like the firebolt that kind of clamps together mm -hmm. would totally lend itself to that kind of stuff. That's because uh, they're yes. mostly they're easier to make components. Um, you need quite a few molds, but yeah, that actually would that is actually a good example of a part which would probably be easier to make. For sure. So, and that's a great topic where, you know, you talk about 3D printing isn't the best for every part because it wasn't designed for that. You know, certain parts don't lend themselves to certain manufacturing styles. Um, you know, casting isn't great for making pressure bearing parts. <laughs> um, you know, you've got issues there. Yeah, so that's true. And that's where other manufacturing methods come in and design for manufacturing and all of that stuff for sure. That's one of the things I love about Jeff Rodriguez is, you know, he's always been a big proponent of use metal where you need metal. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't, you know, do the best you can. Yep. Which is of course why we, why we use the hose clamp because it's, you need metal in some places. So yeah, if, if I was a, oh, go ahead. If I was allowed to pick up guns, we could talk about the liberator 12 K. <laughs> I know, yes, yes, which is quite an interesting design there, um, using you know plates and and threaded rods and such to reinforce where needed, which has become a pretty, I think, a pretty standard design technique actually, um, since he did that. So uh, TH six hundred Mike has uh, he says talking about EDM machining. So you know we we touched on EDM back there a little bit, and. Uh, he says he's been working on an EDM circuit to allow for proper ultra high frequency pulsing needed for a low electrode wear and efficient material burning. So, yes, yeah, so the kind of 
the electronic side of things seems to have been quite an obstacle if you want to get into EDM. Like I, this, the, the channels I followed who've done some stuff with EDM in the past, getting the electronic circuitry and all of that stuff reliably doing doing uh, cutting seems to be the challenge. But now that Rack Robotics is working on it, they have ready to go power supplies, which I have one over here, um, which which they've been developing. It seems that it's now kind of the mechanical side of things that that needs work as well. So I think EDM has a huge amount of potential, just like 3D printing, because it's pretty low cost. I don't think it'll be as cheap as 3D printing, but it's quite close. Like actual wire EDM would be close to the cost of 3D printing. Like you're looking at a thousand dollar machine. Um, and I think it would really open up making small metal parts because it's it can cut through really any any kind of metal. I mean, you can still cut through steels, all of that stuff, which would be difficult to machine. So I think it has a huge amount of potential in the next next two or three years to bring metal manufacturing to the low-cost desktop application, just like 3D printing. So I'm very, very interested in EDM machining for sure. I just don't know that much about it um, is, is the thing. But yeah, I think it's, it's quite interesting uh, for sure. Tons of potential there. All your Remington 700s, you know, all those bolt chase waves, that's all wire EDM cut. Yep. So it's, you know, wire EDM is the modern day version of broaching. Kind of one way to think about it in a way. Yep. Yep. Um, for sure. It's something I was looking at to make super safeties actually for some of the, the parts on it because you can cut long curved complex profiles and parts, which mm -hmm. is hard to do with other methods. So it's... I mean, if you want to cut out, it could be a substitute for laser cutting as an example. So laser cutting is an expensive process. Laser cutting metal is an expensive process. You could do it significantly less with, with much less investment, s slower, potentially, uh, probably definitely slower with a wire EDM machine. You could cut out sheet metal, basically, or, or, or plates with wire with a proper wire EDM setup. Um, you know, you can visualize, you have a plate sitting in a bath and you have a wire that you know, just cuts it out. So that's, and that's totally, totally doable. We just, you know, the machines aren't available off the shelf yet. So for that kind of thing, I think it has a ton of potential. You also have the heating even... issues. What is it? You don't have the heat. So oh. when, you, you know, compared to like laser cutting where you've got heat, you're going to harden the material and yes, you know, exactly. The wire EDM is going to keep your material properties more stable. Yeah. And obviously you, you have to have a wire. So doing holes is more difficult. I mean, there's always trade-offs, but it would give home manufacturers a lot more capability for sure. Um, so let's see. And Aaron Fritz says, learning to run manual machines takes years of practice to be good at. I mean, it's a career people have to dedicate their lives to. I would agree with that. I would fully agree with that. Um, the guys who do incredible work on manual machines, I have a lot of respect for. It's not something you just jump into doing uh, just overnight. Or you do, but you just suck at it. Um, <laughs> which like is us, where I yes. found myself about, you know, four years ago when I jumped into it. Yeah. So well, I say like me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So this kind of ties us right into the last subject I wanted to touch on today, which was lighter than air. So, well, you know, that is not my area of expertise, but I love following along um, with all of those things regarding the rigid air shifts and, and all those things. Yes. Yeah, so have you ever done anything with hot air balloons? I have ridden in some hot air balloons. And, okay, you know, helps. we talked one time about, you know, the fact that I have been in the Goodyear blimp on a tour, which was fascinating. Um I, I would love to see a resurgence of like air travel by blimp. Like, you know, the cruise ships of the sky would be fantastic. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what I'm going for as well. That's what we're working towards. So, but yeah, so right now hot air ballooning is, so my kind of path in lighter than air, I started off, you know, with airships, of course, um, you know, looking at them and getting more and more and more into airships, you know, researching them. And then I kind of got a little bit into looking into gas ballooning. And then that of course led to the only available, lighter than air the only accessible lighter than air we have today which is hot air ballooning which is something which anybody can get into with a reasonable amount of time and and money so um or you know significant amounts of, of, of both really but it's at least doable so right now i'm i am i have actually right here let me grab it i don't know how many of you guys would recognize this but this is 
This is from a this is from a old Cameron balloon. It is a serialized uh, aircraft serialized. You can see the number on there. Official aircraft component, and this is the crown ring for a hot air balloon. And this would go on the top of a hot air balloon. And all of your load tapes come up and attach to it, and it's kind of the uh, it sits at the very apex of the balloon, right at the top. So I got this because it is it is my intention as of now, actually. I'm very strongly considering it, building my own hot air balloon. So it's a significant amount of sewing. However, it has its perks. So that's kind of where I am at right now in the airship world. So we're having to stick with balloons. So why haven't you just bought a bunch of weather balloons and tied them to a lawn chair yet and just had a good time? It's very expensive. Weather? No, I mean, you do the weather balloon route. The gas is very expensive. Oh, yeah. yeah so well, the, I mean, I, it, hot air ballooning should be more expensive than gas ballooning. Hot air ballooning, uh, the balloons are significantly larger. So like, like a one-man hot air balloon, you're looking at a balloon with a volume of like 5,000 cubic feet. And, and this is, I'm going quite small. This is a, this is someone of, this is, you weigh 150 pounds. This is this is a my kind of balloon. If, if you're larger, you'll need a larger balloon. But you're looking at a balloon that's 22 feet in diameter, something like that. A hot air balloon um, needs to be eight times that volume. Yeah. And 40 feet, 45 feet in diameter. It's a huge amount of fabric. Um, you have to have burners, which are specially made. Quite complex, actually. Um you have to have uh, the appropriate specialty fuel tanks. There's, there's all of this stuff, which adds cost. You're burning something like 10 to 20 gallons per hour of propane, depending on your, uh, the, you know, the size of your balloon or, or more, the, you know, the temperature and all of that. Gas ballooning, you have a much smaller balloon. You don't have any of that specialty equipment needed. And the only real cost increases come from special fabric is needed because it has to be anti-static. And, and that fabric currently is not off the shelf. You can't just go buy gas balloon fabric. You have to have it custom ordered. And, and that's exceedingly difficult to do, let alone the expense. Uh, but that doesn't have to be that way. It could be low cost. And then the second issue, and this is the most aggravating one, is you can't buy hydrogen. I mean, you can, but you can't buy it at you can't buy it at anything close to the market price in most parts of the country. The, the, the going pro hydrogen is sold by the kilogram and a kilogram is about 423 cubic feet. So you need about 10 kilograms to fill a one man little ultralight gas balloon. The problem is if you just want to order hydrogen, you'll be paying something to the tune of $100 per kilogram or more. If I, and you have, you're getting it on one of those old fashioned crude outdated tube trucks, not tube trucks, but, uh, not a, specifically not a tube truck. You're getting on steel cylinders on pallets. So it's 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 very heavy, expensive. And you've got so, no way to recapture that in any kind of methodology exactly. that's worthwhile. So, so every time you fly, you're, you're using and dumping $1,000 of hydrogen. And that's for a little tiny one-man balloon. It just goes up from there. So that's why there is really no gas balloon in the U.S. And, and helium is totally out of the question. Someone brings up helium, they need to research a subject more. Helium is actually better. Helium is objectively better. It's, it's more stable um, due to adiabatic heating and cooling. It's more stable in, you know, in vertical flight, and it also uh, permeates. It has a different mechanism of leaking through membranes. Hydrogen and helium leak used through different mechanisms, and hy hydrogen, even though it's a larger molecule because H2, it actually leaks faster because it of the way it interacts with polymers. Um, so... But helium is is ridiculously expensive, and the price is only going up right now. So people don't realize that helium is not a renewable resource. First off, it's not a renewable resource. It's kind of like a fossil fuel. Actually, it's even worse than a fossil fuel regarding its renewability. Yes. Yep. Um, and once it makes it out into the atmosphere, it's gone. <laughs> so exactly. So when I see people filling party balloons, I'm like, guys, there's only so much of that. And another thing people don't know is is there is a significant amount of helium made. And the majority of it goes somewhere you might not expect. It goes to the cooling system, the cryogenic cooling system for uh, for CAT scan machines. That's that's where it goes. That that's the they need for the specification they need. It's the only thing that really works right now. So that's where the majority it, of it goes. With, with no helium, you have no MRI scans really. So you just gotta go sneak down in one of those Texas caves where they store it. <laughs> 
Well, that's the other problem is, and this is the reason the cost went up, is that Congress repealed or got rid of the um, requirement. It's no longer considered a strategic resource, so they no longer are required to capture it. So they basically, the government saw, and, and I don't have a problem with this. I mean, they should, the government shouldn't really be involved, so oh well. But they sold off the National Helium Reserve. So they actually had a big cave filled with ridiculous amounts of helium, and they sold most of it off. And the price has gone up significantly after that after that happened. So it's not really an option right now. And maybe with fusion in the future, we'll get massive sources of helium. But as of now, that's not really happening. So hydrogen remi- remains really your remains really your only option. And uh, it's something you have to live with. So, so in order to make hydrogen safe, you have to have conductive fabrics, take precautions. So you don't have any static. And once you do that, it is actually quite safe. Um, it's not nearly as bad as like a, a, a lot of people I talked to were under the impression that the Hindenburg was the only airship ever built. It traveled like 25 miles per hour and it crashed on its first flight. That seems to me to be the general public consensus, which is wrong. <laughs> It's not surprising. It's, uh, it's sad, but it's not surprising. Well, it's not surprising because think about how many how many large films have been made about space travel. Yeah. Now think about how many large films or any films have been made featuring airships. It's about two it was dozen. Just such a it, it's such a short period of span well, of time. Is, it isn't though. It it was a solid thirty years. It was a big deal. I mean, it was a big big deal. I mean, it was. It was not a, an that's a rel- relatively short span of time. Well, compared to the amount of time that's passed since then, but still, I, I don't know. It's it's because during the 1940s and 50s, there was a massive obsession with with the concept of progress. And I have nothing wrong with with good progress, but there was a there was an obsession with doing things just for the sake of progress, especially I would say in the space 1950s. Race. Yeah, the, the idea yeah, the space of race, the atomic age, and space it's, race. That yeah, exactly. So I think a lot of that people kind of rejected the idea it never really it kind of was cleansed from the culture and it never got back in and it's resulted in very poor education about um what exactly what happened when what's possible so that's, well, i mean uh, the the sheer lack of progress we've made is staggering actually like yes we've gotten way more efficient um in building things but like you know the cell phone was an amalgamation of stuff that was discovered 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't actually done a whole lot of genuinely groundbreaking new stuff since almost the 1960s. Um, Which is, I mean, yes, there's been massive progress, but it's just kind of reconfiguring existing technologies. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, and a lot of it has been more information based technologies, which are awesome and all, but Hey, they only get you so far. Um, and people will disagree with that, but Hey, I, I, I think the, I mean, the, the quantum computing stuff that's coming is fascinating. Mm-hmm. That'll be yeah. kind of a breakthrough for certain things that will lead, Elsewhere. you know, not the quantum computing is great. It's not really great for a lot, but it, but what it will unlock access to will be good. And the information that it can process that's, you know, quantum mechanics is really the, the biggest hole we've seen in progress. Um, over the last 50 since the atomic bomb there just yeah. hasn't been but it is being of, it is being worked on though i mean by quite a lot of people um yeah and then there's there's the discussion of the engineering aspect versus the science part of it you know you can know about a thing but then you need the engineering people to actually take that thing and make something with it make it something real yeah we have wild arms research and development in the chat so that's interesting. He says they use helium in the semiconductor manufacturing at his job. Um, yeah, that is another. Pl- they use hydrogen as well in semiconductor manufacturing, um, I believe, in, to do heating. I think actually, but yeah, it's quite, it's quite, it's used in in it's used in necessary places, and there's and the price is going up. So it's something that we don't want to be wasting. We'll uh, see if you can get a second rate helium deal from uh, Wild Arms. <laughs> yeah, and then um, oh, we have we have quite a few comments here. Which I have not been starring, but yeah. So, so back to the back to the balloons. The the basic issue is obviously fabric. That's simply because of no demand. There, there's there's no demand for gas balloon fabric. So you're not just going to go out and and buy it off the shelf. It has to be custom made. So, but intrinsically, 
all the technology is there. It's been there. Textile, textile technology is very refined and textile, modern textiles are incredible. So that's not really an issue if, if you can get some volume going, but currently the problem comes down to gas. You can, the commercial prices for, for hydrogen are about $2 per kilogram. So that's about 20 bucks to fill your balloon up and go on a two hour flight, which is not bad at all. It's not bad at all. Um, hot air ballooning, you're looking at burning 10 gallons of propane an hour at $253 a gallon. I mean, that's 30 bucks an hour just for propane. That's on a small balloon. So it would be very practical to do gas ballooning if the price would come down on, on even if the price came down to $10 a kilogram, that's a hundred bucks for a flight, which when it comes to aviation may sound like a knot, but it's not that bad, especially when a proper envelope fabric would last a long time, a lot longer than a hot air balloon. Cause it's basically UV lights all you're dealing with, um, which is not insignificant, but with Ted Lar and, and modern films, you can really mitigate that. So it just comes down to getting gas. And I don't know why, but in the U S we basically have two different economies. We have the industrial economy where they, where they, do their thing. And then we have kind of the residential consumer economy. And it's very difficult to, to move between the two. It's, it's, I, I can't just call, I've, I've tried. It's, you can't just call up one of these hydrogen manufacturing companies and, and talk to them. They don't answer their phone. They don't answer their email, any of that stuff. So. Cause it's not worth it to them. There's just, it's exactly. They're just not, yeah, they interested. don't have the time for you. Yeah. Now here though, is what I think is really interesting. You're familiar with green hydrogen at all. You've heard of it. Green hydrogen, it's clean, clean power, all of that stuff. And most people would just go, ah, oh, it's, you know, especially conservative. That's just dumb greeny stuff and all of that. And a lot of it is because they're trying to take a, a round peg and put it in a square hole, so to speak, in a lot of these applications. However, I'm all for it because what it's doing is trying to bring high, even though it's green, you know, from renewable resources, I mean, nothing wrong with that, but they're trying to take, they're, they're making hydrogen much more available. So in California right now, um, you know, as, as much as they have issues, they currently in a couple of the large cities have hydrogen gas pumps, basically, where you can get high pressure hydrogen gas for hydrogen powered cars. And I believe Honda or is Hyundai, th there's a couple of different- Jaguar's got one that's a, yep. no, I don't think it's actually been like released prototype. I think they're phenomenal. Yeah. The, the, um, well, the problem of course is storage and, and that's where airships really shine. Um, the problem with car, the problem currently with high, so hydrogen is a great fuel. Fuel cells are incredible technology. And, it's and all really super cool. Super abundant. And, you know, yes, with nuclear energy, I mean, hydrogen is, I think hydrogen is the most abundant resource on the planet, I believe. Um, I don't get right. It was hydrogen or carbon. I think it's hydrogen. Um, yeah. And it's easy to get from salt water and we can get a lot of hydrogen. Yeah, exactly. So, um, hydro, but because of that, there's a big push and there's currently, there's like, there is actually companies who have answered the phone and they are green hydrogen companies. So there's one guy I actually talked, it was the owner of the company who founded it. He was his job to answer the phone that day. They're opening, it's a biomass hydrogen production facility in California. I don't know the exact process, but I, as far as I can tell, they're probably making methane and then using steam methane reformation to actually produce hydrogen. That's my guess. I don't know that for a fact. But what's interesting is I talked to him and they have big plans. They're getting their current plant up and running. They're selling to industrial customers right now, but they have plans to put a plant in near me here in Tennessee. That's like their next plant in the next like two years. They have a plan to put it in. Um, and that is going to be, cause big disruptions in the hydrogen industry, and it's going to get hydrogen more available. Like in California right now, you can buy hydrogen at a pump for 10 to $20 per kilogram. So if you lived in California, you could actually do gas ballooning for relatively cheap if you had your own hydrogen tank and you just went to the hydrogen pump and bought it and put it in your own tank. Um, and you can get into some legal issues there with hazmat. And you have to be careful to stay under certain weights. but they're due to the entire push for green hydrogen and, and using hydrogen in automobiles. There's now companies making some pretty high tech, high pressure tanks um, to store hydrogen. And there's another company also really friendly. Talk to me, all of that stuff in California. And they, you can get a tank big enough to hold enough hydrogen for one, one man balloon. The tanks are around $10,000 right now, which isn't horrible. They're, they're pretty They're It's, spin they use a spin forming process to make a monolithic aluminum tank and then they wrap it in carbon fiber 
And the whole process in is terms cool. of in terms of aviation, ten thousand dollars is nothing. Yeah. Um, because I mean, that's the other part of that is, you know, getting something that's FFA approved and all that, you know, is. Yes. So, and that's where it gets into experiment. Obviously you would go for, so the thing is for a gas balloon, you could actually go ultralight. Now the issues you can run into is you're in a balloon. So it could be difficult to comply with overflying people and all of that stuff because you can't steer. So you have to make sure you fly in a rural area, but no Recreational regulation. pilot's license for experimental is like, it's almost the wild west. As long as you're in uncontrolled airspace, you, you can do whatever the heck you want. Yes. So going, making many manu manufacturing, selling balloons that are certified, you know, for multiple passengers and all that. Yes, that can be difficult. It, there's some interesting stuff there, which you could get into. But um, there is a question here from iAdventure, and it's how much is the cost of an envelope and gondola currently? Um, so if you want to buy all new components, th there's a manufacturer near me called Head Balloons, Tarp Head. Uh, he builds them with a couple employees. He's been around for, he's one of like only of like three manufacturers in the US or technically four, I think. And uh, well, you know, actually it might be five. Some people like... Are they a manufacturer or they, do they make a couple on their own? It, it's kind of, it's a very small industry as you can imagine, but currently envelopes for a two or three, for like a, a balloon that would carry three people an envelope's going to cost you about 18 grand. And a new basket would probably run a similar price, maybe a little bit more. However, used baskets are pretty easy to get in the used market compared to envelopes because envelopes wear out in 500 hours. The baskets don't. So if you want to get a, a just buy a new system with all the equipment you're gonna need, it would probably you could probably get into it buying a used bottom end and a new envelope, probably for around thirty grand is what it would cost. So it's cheaper than airplanes, um, for sure. Wild Arms had a question in the chat regarding weaponized balloons. There you go. Yeah, and uh, I, you know one of my first thoughts about this is how actually hardened they would be to uh, electronic attacks. As far as the control system or what part of them? So when you, when yeah, well, just the gases and the, the fact that they're not going to fall out of the sky. Um, yeah. You know, if you have that nuclear detonation, you get that, that blast wave that zonks out all of the electronics, balloon would be fine. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, just, just the balloon. I mean, now if you want to have any hardware on board the balloon, that that could be a that could be a different story. Lose your um, communication, lose your navigation, but you know you're not going to fall out of the sky. But I've talked about this a little bit uh, with you know canine defense uh, tech on on Twitter uh, using hydrogen balloons to or you know helium if you, if you have it, uh, but using balloons to carry uh, jamming equipment or to possibly carry uh, uh, different RF equipment is actually quite quite would be quite a practical thing I think, um, and I, it's been done to some degree so balloons are quite uh balloons would be quite interesting for that application now as far as like an autonomous balloon airship deployment just becomes difficult um especially airships just they're they're as far as being radar resistant i really just don't know um modern high frequency radar might be able to pick them up i i just really don't know it's it's um if you've done right possibly you could avoid, you could avoid radar I was having to sign into Google here so I could interact with chat. So, ah, uh, yes, I'm just going to scan through. Yep. Uh, let's see. We've got a few good comments here. Uh, uh, I was fascinated. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, I'm sure you have, the designs of the balloon assist lifted wind generators. Those are always fascinating to so, me. So, yes, I have seen those. I don't know of any that have actually been deployed like successfully anywhere. My problem I've seen with a couple them is. In Japan pan on the tethers and they're actually, kites more than actually, balloons so i've seen some on kites i haven't seen any on yeah a, a lighter than air buoyant device the problem you run into is cost versus benefit and balloon lighter than any aircraft is expensive balloons are no exception and just maintaining altitude maintaining uh you know gas slowly leaks out uh different varying weather conditions maintaining the proper buoyancy it, it's all um, it all gets pretty complicated. It's, it's, their balloons are actually quite a complicated aircraft when you get into the details on it. They look simple, but there's a lot that goes into it. You know, just look at look a little bit into uh, the concept of stability. So adiabatic heating and cooling as the balloon rises and descends. It's 
it makes a big deal. And the, the, the weather conditions at the time, the lapse rate, if that's the right word, the, the lapse rate of the atmosphere, basically the temperature gradient of the atmosphere changes. Sometimes we'll have a temperature inversion. That all, the, that all changes the stability your balloon has with altitude. So that's really important when navigating a gas balloon. Your balloon could be very stable at one altitude, or it could be unstable where you'll actually accelerate downwards or upwards, um, and you have to counteract that with a, a ballast control system. So balloons are a pretty complex aircraft. Gas balloons. Hot, yeah, exactly. Um, hot air balloons tend to be more brute force. Um, so the physics are still there, but it kind of doesn't matter so much. Because um, you can adjust the lift properties of your balloon, which you can do with gas balloons somewhat, but you're going to burn through resources like crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to scan through here for any good comments. There's a couple of them. I, I always find it fascinating. I is one of those things that I think about occasionally that the idea of, you know, the, the entry barrier to space, you know, where is the line of space changes depending on how warm or hot the earth is and how, mm -hmm. how swelled up the atmosphere is. I, I don't think a lot of people understand how that swelling of those different pressure gradients around the world well, and work depending on the look heat. Look at the thickness of the troposphere. Um, with your um uh, with your latitude if i'm using the right one um you know as, as you get closer and closer to the poles your atmosphere thins out basically which is why we get the borealis effect and things like that because more solar radiation is making it through that thinner atmosphere yes exactly and, and, it, and it, it affects um you know jet travel so so flying above the weather in the tropics is actually can be quite difficult because your your thunderstorms and turbulence go a lot higher than they would it's, it's well, more I difficult. thought we didn't we didn't fly over the poles because the Earth is flat. No, I'm talking about the, this. This is a difficulty with the um, flying on the equator. Of course, the poles we don't fly over because certainly it is flat, especially the South Pole. Okay. And we can get into that as well if you'd like to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, I'm personally a hollow earther. I've been converted. Exactly. That's I yeah. mean, anytime I deal with a flat earther, I always go hollow earth. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, or I will revert to turtles all the way down. <laughs> It's all turtles. Yeah. Yep. Turtles and, and everything. Um, let's see. Um, what it will cost. Lots it's of kind of an here. interesting comment that I'd never thought of there from Simon in the chat about it. The impact of the size of the atmosphere based on the gravitational pull of the sun. So the idea of a tidal atmosphere force? I've actually never really considered that either. Um, I wonder what effect that has, actually. I don't know. I don't know what effect I don't know either. Have. I've never thought about that, but that makes sense. Uh, does it? No, because the atmosphere doesn't really have any mass, so I wouldn't think that it, gravity would... It does have mass. Oh, I mean, it's that's why it's that's why we have an atmosphere. That's why it exists, yeah. So the gravity is able to trap those, yeah. It's an interesting idea of a tidal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I don't know. Actually, it probably has a negligible effect, which is why we don't know about it because it's, but it probably exists to some degree. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Let's see. All right. So I'm going to hop through some star comments here we have, but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's basically where we're at with the, with the balloons and all of that. I, I think it's fascinating the, the airships are the only means of transport currently. It, it's the means of transport best suited for renewable resources. So if you're actually, if someone's actually concerned about using renewables, the airship is the most optimal. Carrying fuel, hydrogen, is it's the only craft which has enough space, the airship, to carry enough fuel to power fuel cells. It's really the only aircraft which has enough surface area for solar cells because a solar-powered airship, if, if you kind of get into the numbers, is actually practical. Um, in, in a lot of cases, because, uh, especially with modern, there's some modern flexible solar cells are exceedingly light for how much power they put out. They're, that's very thin film. Now, longevity costs, those are all issues, but it's, it's quite practical for renewable resources. So, I mean, that's one interesting thing with them, but I just find them a fascinating, just like a submarine in the air. I just find them fascinating. Just the whole concept. So Am Amazon does, Amazon does own a, I believe it's a utility patent on basically warehouses that are drone operated 
uh, by balloons. So they'll have that rigid airship that'll be over the city, and it's, it has drones that fly material up for storage in the sky that can be delivered by drones. It's the it's the concept because so the the big airships have problems. Obviously, uh, a big issue with airships is 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 ground handling. So a concept that's been around for a long time, and that's I think what this is tying into, is the airship never lands, and you simply ferry cargo to and from the airship. I am personally more interested in much smaller airships, like a personal sport airship, because um, I mean, rather than that, but I think it has potential. It's just the problem is the scale is so large, the initial investment is just too big right now, at least for anyone willing to go into it. So that's why... I think a big problem is a lot of companies who have moved to going into airships, and there's been quite a few over the last 50 years. They're always trying to like directly compete with trucking or or trains, or they're trying to get right into the market. And in order for it to work, the scale is too big for them to get into. So I think they're biting off more than they can chew. I think we have to look at this as on a much smaller scale at first before we can before we can get greedy and scale up. So have you seen the manned drone racing? From like EXA series. I have seen manned drones. I have not seen them race. Um, yeah, if you want to pull that up on like a Google search, the EXA series drone racing, um, those things are really cool. So I have been following some of the manned um, UAV style. Obviously, that's kind of counter that those are two backwards terms. But I have, let me see. Oh, okay, I see it there. Yeah, yeah. That's quite interesting. Action of the limit. Yeah, I mean, just basically really big quadcopters that fly. There's a company, it's it's called Blackbird, I think, that makes, it's a VTOL, so it has tandem wings, um, and it's kind of a redundant system. And, and they I think they're currently selling them for like $80,000 a piece. And it's an ultralight. You can just buy it and fly it. Um, and it's kind of on the same lines. This is really, it's, the whole concept is really interesting because it's, can be significantly lower cost aviation. Um, however, for me, safety is a big concern. So these are pretty cool um, because they basically have, uh, I can't remember the name of the system right now, how planes know where each other are. Um, uh, probably uh, uh, ADSB, like remote ID. Yeah, so it has that essentially on steroids to where it basically has, you know, fly-by-wire digital components to that to where they won't actually crash. You mean like, they're, oh, they're talking about doing like, they're doing like canyon races in these things. It, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. There's another company. Um, in fact, I will. So this is, this is what uh, Snow is talking about. It's a, it's, it's racing with, with big, big, big quadcopters, big multi-rotors, basically. It's um, it eight. Eight rotors on them, all electric engines. They're they're pretty fascinating, and they're talking speeds like 170, 180 miles an hour through canyons. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite it's quite interesting. Uh, there's a there's a company who's working on. It's called Orb Aerospace, O R B Aerospace, and they are working on some some interesting stuff as well. Some interesting vertical takeoff and landing. So yeah, so small electric aircraft. There's quite a bit of really interesting work going on in that area as well, for sure. Um, but yeah. So let's that's see. an interesting video of a guy that was doing the 3D printed oscilloidal rotors. And I think those are fascinating. I don't Iso think I said that right. Isolators. Is that basically like where it turns horizontally? Um, it's like two rings. Two rings are the props. Yep. And they're just incredibly quiet. Yep, and, I, know, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I, a K9 rocket, uh, tech and I were talking about that. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. He was talking about some of the issues with them. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, it, there's some interesting, super quiet props for sure. There's, yeah. There's they're a lot they're of, fascinating. There's a lot of interesting stuff going in that area. Um, so for those wondering what the name was, it was EXA series. EXA, uh, EXA racing. Is what the name of that was yeah i hadn't i hadn't heard of that that they were actually doing that um i hadn't seen that i have seen there, there's but there's but i've seen companies working on just you know private transportation devices which which have yeah cool tons well. of that out there but these i'm i'm watching these things they look really really slick yeah if they if they get up and running working and have that obstacle avoidance and 
you know, it's it's real life pod racing. It's many people in the chat kind of came to the same realization that it's, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I mean, right now you could go out and build one probably for 20 grand. I just wouldn't trust myself flying in it. That's the only thing. I mean, you could fly it. You probably get away with it for a while. But the thing is, if anything goes wrong, that's it. It's yeah. And, and range is so limited on them. I mean, they're just not practical. Yeah. Um, um, so. with, with current battery tech and all of that. And that's why, you know, airships are interesting. So there's uh, I adventure says probably never want to drive a H2 powered car. I personally would love to have an H2 powered car. Um, they're expensive and you can't get hydrogen right now, but if you could, I'd have nothing wrong with it. I, I think it's, I think it's cool. Um, I think it's super efficient. I, I guess my, my drawback is yes, I do have envisions of like, you know, the Pinto and what happened with that kind of, I mean, hydrogen is very volatile, but I just don't know that I trust the common everyday person with high pressure vessels. So that, yeah. So, so that is kind of the, 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 the what makes, hydrogen dangerous in that context is not hydrogen hydrogen itself is not that dangerous it's i mean yes it, it can be but it, it, it's volatile but not that bad but it's the, the high problem, pressure component yes. the problem is yeah. you're looking at five to ten thousand pounds per square inch when you start thinking about that that's absolutely ridiculous so i have a, a i have a high-end air rifle that's like 3500 psi and it scares the heck out of me <laughs> Yeah, so so that is what's that is the problem with hydrogen powered vehicles, and that's why I mentioned the, the the square hole round peg thing because currently storing hydrogen is a big problem, and that's why I say airships are interesting because they don't have that issue. So, um, and I adventure also says way cheaper than buying a one fifty two plus one seventy two. He's referring to comparing balloons to manned, uh, I mean to fixed wing aviation. They are. Aviation's expensive. Balloons aren't that bad. I, I've worked the operating cost out of a balloon to prop a small balloon. The one I'm looking at getting is probably going to be about eighty dollars per hour to operate. Well, and, and small aircraft just one, aren't being produced. I mean, you know. Well, the, so the, the whole so the FAA is a lot more reasonable than the ATF. I'll say that right away. Most, well, not a lot of what the FAA does, and probably most, is basic common sense. Like most of the regulations, like I have no issue with it because I'm going to do that anyway. Like that's obviously that's basic common sense there. However, when it comes to their regulations on manufacturing, um, and then say. when it comes to the regulations on manufacturing and some of the limits installed, I think it's too much. It's, it's suppressing aviation. There's a, there's people should have the option of taking more risk when it, and, and that would to get and we'd be having better innovation, all of that stuff. So I, I have I do have an issue with 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 the requirements on certification and the difficulty of getting involved and a lot of it and is kind of a buddy buddy system if you want to get manufacturing stuff. small aircraft parts is a monopoly. It once you get yep. the approval letter to be able to make that part, nobody else can make that part. You are the guy that has the letter of approval to make this component for an airplane, and it's yours. There is a no compete in the FAA space, and, and the, the problem. Thing is there aren't new people getting involved in that very often. It's even worse. It's even worse than that. If you die and you're the guy, there is currently no mechanism to pass that on. Oh, wow. I'm yeah. not joking here. So, I mean, so unless your family member can claim it, own it under your estate it's, process and then actually pass that on and sell it. It's kind of it like an SOT almost. Except yeah. An SO yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's pretty bad, and it's it's not. I mean, yes, obviously safety is 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 important in aviation. However, I disagree with putting safety ahead of making people be able to make the decision for themselves to fly in something which could be dangerous. And you currently can. You can currently go build an experimental aircraft, use whatever parts you want, and people do it all the time. And it's actually experimental aircraft are are quite safe. Um, and as time goes on, they actually get safer. You know. People begin to understand more stuff. It's, it's you just can't mass produce it. You can you, you can mass produce the no, kits. That's the whole thing. That's that, that's what you would. Th the regulations don't say that though. That's implied. But the thing is, you, so with experimental aircraft, really the only option you have is you can you can like co companies will build balloons. Special shaped balloons are all experimental. There's no certified special shaped. Sure, balloons. sure. Um, they make them like in South America actually. There's a guy in Brazil who makes special shaped balloons. He manufactures them one at a time, you know, custom shapes, ships them to the U.S., they get them certified. How they do that, 
I, I believe they're certified as ex like for exhibition purposes, I think is what they're there for. And they so they can kind of like squeeze it in there. But if you want to just build a normal airplane, the only category you can really fit it into is the recreational experimental, you know, for basically hobby use. Which is a super cool space, by the way. Yes. Um, um, the the but, regulations there are actually quite good. Yes. But the thing is, there are – like a good example, the, the only manufacturer of gas balloons in the U.S., um, Padelt. He makes them basically in his garage one at a time over like two years because there's four of the few people who do gas ballooning, uh, which is very low. It's mostly it's mostly in, in Germany and you know, in Europe. But it's a tiny bit in the U.S. right now. Um, he makes them experimental. He makes them and sells them. I have no idea how that works. How how no one else, how does that work? They're not for exhibition. He's making experimental aircraft and then he's selling them. So there's all these the, the regulations in with the FAA are not hard and set in stone. They're just regulations and they're basically up to the interpretation of the administrator. And if you sure. know somebody in the ATF and on the ATF in the FAA, <laughs> you've, you've, these guys have been, have been doing it for 40, 50 years. Um, they know people and they can just get stuff done. And that's kind of how it works. Just a buddy, buddy system. So, and with ballooning, it is very, very much that way. So, FAA guys are normally way better than, than ATF guys, but they're still a government bureaucracy with all the same problems attached. So Davey J says, doesn't aluminum foil and toilet bowl, to toilet bowl cleaner produce hydrogen? So what he's, what he's referring to here is the reaction between aluminum and um, sodium hydroxide. Actually, yeah. um, and, and yes, that is actually a way to produce, to produce hydrogen. I've done that to fill balloons. A more accepted method in the past was to use iron and sulfuric acid. And um, I probably mostly due to back then you can't – the aluminum was very expensive and specialty. The problem with either of those methods is the amount of gas you need for a balloon is astronomical compared to the amount of gas you need you know, for a manned balloon compared to a toy balloon. So the amount you, – you're, you're talking thousands of pounds of metals and, and, and solution mixed together to produce enough gas for a balloon. It's – it's ridiculously expensive. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, you'd have to go with the electrolysis method would be the only way that I would, yep. if you're going to do it at home, that's about the only, you know, you can do boiler plates and you yep. have solar powered but and, you know, you set up a, then you got to separate, which is not hard. Electrolysis would be incredibly awesome. Um, the problem is it's also very expensive. It, building a little electrolysis model on your desk to blow up a little, to blow up little soap bubbles. I've done that. It works. It's fun. super doable. But the, as I said, the it's it's just the scale. People don't grasp the scale of a gas balloon compared to what you, what you do with a with a bunch of little bubbles. So that's the challenge you run into. And well, um, and the, you're going to need massive vacuum systems with tank storage, and then you got to the, the purity level. You're going to so problem. basically what you need is uh. The technology is PEM. It's proton exchange membrane electrolysis. Oh uh, yeah, and it's it's significantly higher efficiency, um, higher purity. It it runs on pure water. There's no. Um, it's not you know compared to like an alkaline system requires an alkaline electrolyte to make, provide conductivity. The problem is a PEM generator that's big enough to fill a balloon in a reasonable amount of time. When I say reasonable, I mean like one week. That's what I mean by reasonable. You're looking at a third of a million dollars. They're really, really expensive, and it's like a machine on like a shipping container, like a it's like, or it's like two pallets. They're they're not that quite that big. It's like two pallets. You have your water purification. It's it's very um it's it's very expensive right now. So that's that's the issue you run into. Uh, but I think that can change uh, hopefully here in the next few years. Um, I think we have something. Uh, I adventure is hating on hydrogen. Something about learning on lessons in the nineteen twenties. Not really, actually. All the issues they had with hydrogen with airships were all basically all due to bad textiles um, is what there is what there. And we don't you know need to dive into too many details, but uh, modern textiles fix most of those issues or pretty much all. So let's see. Uh, we have almost out of comments here to run through. I think we've, Oh, we actually still have 62 people watching and we're about here at the That's end. That's incredible. I don't I know. know. I didn't, I never saw what it peaked at. It, it wasn't. I knew this would be a slow stream just because. Um, well, thanks for that. <laughs> because I knew I would be discussing topics um, that would not 
fascinate most of my viewers. They're here for particular we, things, and I yeah, knew, we we didn't go very controversial we, in such a myriad of topics. And I, I know it's technical. Um, We're getting a little technical. Yeah, it's. I, I knew I, I'm having snow on, so I'm going to discuss the appropriate topics. I know that's probably not going to fascinate that large of a group, but those yeah, who are we, watching, we didn't get into reloading. We didn't get into all kinds of stuff. So much stuff. I know. Um, but yeah, so there's just so many fascinating topics out there, guys, other than just 3D printing guns. So that's very fascinating. That's what I do. But there's so much interesting stuff to get into. So three more comments here. Internet users talking about uh, my AR9 lower. Once I get it figured out, it would be awesome to have Magwell inserts done. Um, that would be cool. Personally, I'm not that interested in it because I think you should just print a proper lower. But um, yeah, I mean, Magwell inserts could definitely be a possibility. Um, uh, there's one out there by a gentleman by the name of 458 SOCOM. Uh, I don't know that he ever officially released it. That one had a last round bolt hold open as well that I thought was pretty clever. Yeah. I don't, yeah. but I don't know if that one's actually officially released. 450. I'm gonna make a note of that real quick. Um, 458 SOCOM was the developer that made a, um, AR 15 to nine mil uh, Glock mag. I remember well looking at that a long time ago, but I couldn't find it again when I was doing the development on this guy. So I had to kind of go take it my own way. But I remember, I just remember he had a clever system of levers for his last row bolt hold open that apparently worked quite well. So that's where. Yeah, my, my favorite method of is the, the Gibbs screw method of securing uh, the magazine adapters in place. Um, yeah, that's a whole different story. Yeah. Um, so we have a, another comment here from TH 600 Mike. He says, is the company that, that, um, that was doing the Kickstarter or whatever for their little 3d printer based a, um, EDM, the design is very limited. So I think he's referring to the company I mentioned, which is rack robotics who did a Kickstarter on their EDM power supply. Currently their EDM power supply is just rigged up to a 3d printer with a little electrode that you can use to very slowly cut aluminum. It's not practical really at all. That's just the proof of concept, what they've developed. They developed the power supply and now they're working on the more mechanical side of things. The power supply itself is actually very capable and um, it's just the, the limitation currently is the mechanical setup and the electrode and all of that stuff. So they're actually working on that and doing some pretty cool stuff. So it's, it's not as limited as you might think they're working on, they're, they're doing some very good work. Um, and then I adventure oh, once again, this is along the ballooning lines. He says, do I smell a covert mission to China with latest video of the latest design uh, on a LTA lighter than air? I'm not sure what latest video is referring to, but this is probably a reference to the Chinese spy balloon. Um, high altitude. Um, the There are super pressure balloons. High altitude super pressure balloons are actually a really fascinating subject and can be used it's a very low cost way of sending an aircraft into another country. And um, it's actually something that you probably could do. There are hobbies to have done it. The problem is communicating with your aircraft. You really need satellites to communicate with your balloon to get data back. So that's, that's the issue you run into. Um, but yeah. Okay. So let's see. I think we're through everything here. Wild arms mentions being on the East coast. That would be quite cool. Uh, just, I think he might be moving to your area, Mr. Snow. He is. He, he'll be uh, several hours from me, but definitely a very close proximity to me uh, coming up. So I'm pretty excited about that. And, That's going to uh, be pretty cool. I'm sure we're going to get up to plenty of hijinks. I look forward to him being in my neck of the woods. So yes. speaking of like really dumb technical stuff, wildcat calibers. I've been playing with one recently a lot called a, uh, a six millimeter dasher. Whoa. That's so that looks like a wildcat for sure. It's actually a wildcat of a wildcat. It actually gets really bad. <laughs> that's uh, the, the aspect ratios there are, are large. Yeah. I wish I could put this, I'll go put this like next to a two, two, three. So it's really, it's, it's wide. It's actually like a 30 cal. This starts its life as a, 30 BR, 30 bench rest rifle case. It, we neck it down to six millimeter, and then we actually hydroform the uh, the neck to what's called an Ackley improved at that 45 degree angle. 
So this is right here is the actual little hydroforming press. So when you say hydroformed, you're using water. Yes. So you fill the case with water. And as the dye comes down, it goes up inside of this dye and it'll actually reform the neck angle to what's called an Ackley improved neck angle. That's extremely esoteric. <laughs> and then so after they're hydroformed, we'll generally go and we'll actually chamber form them after that to get the final shape. Um, you know, so you're basically just firing your, your brass one time to conform to the chamber of the rifle. Um, so we actually have to cut these chambers with reamers on the lathe um, out of the barrel blanks. <laughs> that's so, so that's where so, we're, so we're buying the the Krieger barrel blanks and then cutting and, the chamber. Hold on, yeah. So so to be able to fit this very specific caliber that we're building. Um, let me grab a reamer. So, so I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand the. I'm trying to understand the why here uh, at this uh, point. The why is ballistic coefficients on these things are absolutely nuts. Um, I'm chasing three inch groups at a thousand. I see. Okay, that's ambitious. So there's your chamber reamer. Okay, that's to that be able looks to... very custom made. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 uh, this is probably one of the geekier things that te on the technical so. geek side that that gets up there. So TH six hundred Mike wanted to see the water forming die closer to see kind of how it uh, worked. Yeah. So there's not really a great way to show this unless I take it apart, which I really don't want to do. But essentially, you fill up your case with water, the, the, the brass casing with a little bit of water. And I'm going to see if I can get it in frame here. I don't know if this is going to work. Hold on, boys. So it's just a form. So as you press your brass up inside of there, the form is inside of this loading die and it'll reshape the neck and blow it out from the inside of the actual brass casing instead of just the, so the outside. The water is trapped in the inside, and as you put it up there, the water is compressed, and it fills the case out. Correct. Okay. okay. So it's supporting the case. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a form on the outside that presses down, but then the water also supports the inside of the case so, so it doesn't crack, essentially. Yeah, that's... Um... Extr that sounds like an expensive round to mass produce. Um, yes. <laughs> well, you know, actually, it's not that expensive. It's not that expensive to make, but it is time consuming to make. It's that's really the. So, if I put any value to my time, yeah, I don't even want to think about how much that round costs. Yeah. Um. um yeah. This is the annealer that I use. So this is an induction annealer. <laughs> Okay, and you're heating up so the brass just, case to to. Does it just do one at a time? Yeah, one at a time. How long does but that it does take? It, well, it'll do just about any of them. So I can put any case inside of there, uh, much, whether it's you know. How, two, but how three. much time does it take to do that? Oh, it's nothing. It's like you know, five six seconds a piece. No. Oh, okay. I see. And then yep. there's the scale that I use, <laughs> which is okay. Over the top. Yes, it looks that way. <laughs> so that's a medical grade pharmacy scale um, that's been retrofitted for reloading. Yeah. And uh, TH Shadow Mike says the case work hardened or something. And that is the case. The case is work hardening. You have to, you have to soften it up afterwards. Yeah. So after you shoot it, after you fire form it in the chamber, once it's fit to your chamber, if you want to reload it multiple times, you have to anneal it. Otherwise, your cases will start so, cracking. So the first time you shoot it is still part of the production process. Is that what you're saying? And it's only afterwards you get the real good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So you got to you got to build yourself into the load, and then you got to tune the barrel, which is a whole other fascinating concept of barrel tuning. Um, and this is really cool. So this is a little miniature arbor press. With uh, looks like you got a dial micrometer on there. Yeah. So this is actually a a bullet seeder. And uh, so this is all kind of um, a fixed micrometer for seeding the bullets. 
Okay. And so you'll put your you put your bullet actually down down in uh, your bullet in your case go up inside of there. You press it on this little pad, so it goes like this. Case goes in there with a bullet already lined up. And then what you'll do, let me take that out of there before it gets stuck, is you're actually going to come down on this mechanism, and you can, you're going to, when you seat that bullet, you can see an, an indication of how much force is actually being used for your neck tension when seating the projectile inside of the case. Okay. Um, and you want all of them to be the same. I, I imagine, but that's that's getting that's getting out there to say the least. So this yeah, is funny because my entire experience reloading was doing 300 blackout, subsonic 300 blackout. Yeah. And my entire goal was just like quant, just trying to do it like as cheaply and just figure out all the little tricks to just make it as quick as possible. And precision was like absolutely the last thing I thought about. So this is like so. This is interesting. I, I was like, what, so what is this? that that circle right there? Yep. So um, it's about a three, two and a half inch, three inch circle. That's three rounds in a thousand. Okay. And that's your goal, trying to get do that consistently. Yeah, I can I can get three inch groups at a thousand. Yeah, but I need to do it more consistently. So, you know, I, I start getting, you know, five, six inch groups and um, I feel like a failure. Let me do the math there. A five inch group at a thousand yards. That's half an MOA, I believe. Is that right? Correct. Yep. I'm looking for quarter MOA at a thousand. That's pretty small. For reference, guys, I think the Orca does like six to eight MOA. So and, and it's a it's a game of nonlinear returns. Like once you going from six MOA to three MOA is like it's pretty simple. You just add rigidity and you're gonna be there. Yeah. You know, but going from one MOA to half MOA is you're Difficult. getting into some pretty serious stuff. Um so then that's when you get into stuff like this. Uh so this is a, a still a barrel liner that's only been threaded. So, see, this part is completely blank. It has not been threaded to fit to an action or a, t or a tenon thread. But on this side, let me come over here in better light. This fluorescent light is terrible for this stuff. This is yeah, really called is. a barrel tuner. Okay. I can see you've got some graduations on there. A scale. Yes. So, uh, we all know that barrels, when you fire them in a firearm, you're going to see barrel whip. You see the barrel fluctuating. This allows you to adjust the length of the barrel to actually adjust the tuning of the barrel when you're shooting. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find um, what's called a node. So if you've got, if you can imagine a wave, mm -hmm. it's way easier if I had a whiteboard of knowledge. If you had a wave going across the screen where it crosses that center point on, between the ups and downs, that's the node. And the idea is you want the bullet to be leaving the muzzle at one of those nodes in the wave. You want your barrel to be to be doing this, and you want the end of the barrel to be stationary, basically. Correct. And you can use, there's two ways you can achieve that typically. You can achieve that either by adjusting the load, so the how much powder and in, in power is in your round. You can graduate your black powder by you know a half a grain and adjust how that that barrel frequency is or you use one of these and you can adjust the length of your barrel essentially by graduation steps and change your node interesting um so this what is, this is this is okay so i do have one question for you and this is back to the flat yes. earth thing of course In, this is right on this subject though but first th Hunter mike asks you what the barrel material is so what material are you using on your barrel that you're able to cut and ream and all that stuff, but it's still satisfactory? Uh, this is, I think this is, I don't remember. It's a stainless, but I don't remember which one off the top of my head. It's a Krieger barrel. I mean, look at Krieger barrel blanks. Okay. So yeah. then you can get so into it's a stainless. 
to stainless, but I don't remember which stainless. And yeah. I think that I think those have also been cryogenically stabilized. Oh, okay, yeah. So it gets pretty exotic as well, just in the barrel blanks. So <sighs> yeah, it's silly. The question I had for you is what kind of compensation do you do with at that levels of distance and precision with the Coriolis effect of the Earth's spin? Is spin that drift. You- spin drift is real. Um and you know, at a thousand yards, it, it's really not it's not huge. You know, it's only like three and a half to four inches on that upward right hand. It, it, but it's it's almost like it's hard to tell how much of it sometimes is Coriolis versus how much is just calling the wind. Yeah. I'd imagine that'd be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Very so, difficult. I mean, Coriolis stuff does have an impact, but it's so, and you can't account for it, but the wind is the larger factor. You, you're going to be calling for the wind more than you're really counting for Coriolis effect. And I mean, all that stuff is in the Kestrel. So you bring out your little Kestrel ballistics computer. It, it, it does all the math for us. Um, I'm not allowed to touch firearms, but uh, see if I, can, I don't know if I can do this one. Back here is a, uh, a Barrett with the Bohr's computer. Mounted on the, on the scope there. Yeah, so the Barrett Bohr's computer is an optic computer, one of the earlier generations of these optic computers that it reads all the atmospheric pressures and um, you just dial in your range and it does the rest of the work. Oh, that's interesting. Right there on top yeah, of the scope. Yeah, they're pretty slick. Huh. Yeah, yeah it, does it integrates little... with the scope. Once you get into and this that... long range shooting stuff, everything just becomes so much more nuanced and wow. Yeah, I mean, so it's funny that I'm making 3D printed guns. Like when I make these like F1 version bolt actions for long range precision, and then I'm like 3D printing a firearm with that level of care. It's just silly. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the contrast there. It's got to be it strong. It is massive. Like, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's a pretty big difference. But yeah, getting uh, accuracy is difficult. I mean... Even with like, even at, on the on the high level, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm not high level, the course level, like with the orca trying to reduce reduce uh, the the uh, the drift when using plastic has been quite difficult. So it's um, and it's kind of yeah, like jittery. Where where is it? You know, where where's your flexing? What's going on? I've I've done a bunch of experiments and I've never gotten past six MOA consistently. I mean, I've gotten some groups, but consistently six MOA is like a hard spot. Um, and it's, I don't know. It's quite, it's always a question of how much of it is heat expansion of the barrel versus the, I've ruled that out. I've done, I've done tests with just a couple, you know, just, a, just like five round group and then full cool down, all that stuff. It's, uh, there's some shifting going on. There's something that's flexing somewhere. I've tried the, the new PET carbon fiber from bamboo is significantly stiffer than the nylons. However, mm-hmm. it had no impact. So is the scope yeah, drifting you- on the rail? You tried glass bedding, uh, I, the barrel mounts. I've done that now on uh, two of them. And what's interesting is on the latest one, the PET carbon fiber, I well, I have all of the, in fact, let me, let me see if I can bring them up real quick. Yeah, I, I had actually quite a bit of shifting. So there's two different aspects, I, I issues I have. One of them is just group size. And, you know, we don't, we don't, we all know what that is. The other one is, um, is actual zero shifting between groups so your group kind of moves around and that's, i wonder if you have a headspace issue i've i've done it with with multiple barrels um the barrels gauge out with you know they're within the specs within yeah the but it doesn't mean that it's not changing that spec which would change your point of impact pretty drastically but the headspace is determined by the bolt and barrel extension. So the barrel moving forward and backwards a little bit should have no effect on head spacing. That was the only thing. That's been my thought on it. Um, the, the issue. Well, but th- there's quite a bit of range of acceptable head space though. Yeah. So, so, I mean, we're only talking about, you know, two thousandths of an inch in shift can have a three or four inch impact difference. Well, so the question though is, how would the barrel, mo- how would that headspace shift occur? Is the question. Just even from the expansion of the plastic, if, but, if that's actually, as but as far as I see it, the plastic doesn't affect the headspace basically at all. 
um, because the you have a barrel and a bolt, and if the barrel moves around here, the bolt is still locking into it. The, the, it does the, lock into it. I, I'm with you there, but there are some components there that will change it. it but from what I can see, the, those changes wouldn't be as big as I'm seeing. Like, I don't know. I just I can't see how that would change it that much. It's it's not probably the sole factor, but it's one of those many it's contributing factors, factors yeah. in the line that adds to that, you know, um, that tolerance. I, I'm just I, I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah. Um. So what I'm seeing is uh, here's I'm going to share my screen. Let's go present share screen. The problem is I have all this data and it's kind of like spread out too much. I need like well, and then you start trying to figure out stacking tolerances of what data actually matters and what doesn't. Exactly. Uh, here, this this is testing from earlier this year. I haven't marked three twenty eight. So back in back at the end of March, this is a bunch of groups I did at hundred yards with. Um, this is my epoxy bedded orca, and the groups are are pretty big, but you can see that they're moving around here. There's a progression from the top from the top left over to the right, and then down. Um, along the bottom uh, from from left to right. And you can see the group is in the bottom and then it kind of shifts over to the um, it kind of shifts over to the left hand side and then it shifts back down again. It shifts up a little and um, this was and I've, had, I've done this is kind of an example of the shifting I'm having but it's basically the group is moving around as um you know as you shoot the gun and and what caused that is the is the barrel itself and the barrel mount actually shifting so i fixed most of this by a, epoxy bedding helped so in this particular photograph i was showing it's still shifting however it's a lot it's better than it was and, and a better example of that was more more recent testing with my pet carbon fiber orca where I actually had really bad shifting. It was like 10 MOA. It was really bad. And that's because the barrel mount was just a tiny bit loose in there. So I epoxy bedded it and the shifting went back down to like 2 MOA, which is still big, but it's way better. So the, the epoxy bedding has, has caused a significant impact in that particular application. However, the groups are still right now. In fact, let me bring up. I will see. I, I believe I have a 25-yard PET carbon fiber. Uh, this is uh, at a hundred. This is at a hundred yards. It's kind of. I just projected it. Let's go share screen. There so we go. Three D so arms. Three D arms makes a pretty good point inside of the chat there as well, regarding that even even though there is lockup between the bolt interface of the actual bolt, you know, even changing the angle can have mm -hmm. pretty drastic effects. I almost feel like I need to intentionally change the angle as dramatically as I can to try to find out what those effects are. Like, I wonder how to see how, how big of an effect does it make? Cause he's right. Yeah. Changing the, the, that's, this is the primary thing that would be shifting with, with headspace. He's right. It would be the, the, the bolt barrel alignment as things which, move around. which has a, which has a massive effect. Um, based on the way that that casing actually interfacts interfaces with the free bore into the rifling if it's if it's not consistently coming interfacing with that rifling it's going to wobble yeah um but i mean but so so but this group i'm looking at right here this is this is a group which i took at 25 yards it's projected to a 100 yard scale the dots are, are a quarter inch apart at 100 yards so a quarter moa roughly between dots and this entire group here is i think this is an eight and a half by 11 sheet of papers with the dots are on the entire group is like an eight moa group with one flyer yeah and th this is including shifting so with the shift the two moa of shifting i'm looking at eight eight practical moa now for the original goal of the rifle this is just barely good enough my goal was i wanted to have like a light carbine you could hit like a center of mass sized object at 100 yards and you can do that with eight moa consistently but i want to i want shifting is a massive problem <laughs> well this is including shifting this includes okay. the, this this includes the two of my shifting the group itself is is like five or six moa this is including the shifting which i've once it's epoxy bedded it's quite consistently within the margins here um mm -hmm. but but it's still eight moa that's that's ridiculously horrible compared to yeah. what it could be and well and, 
Let's go. But it's home built. I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, I just I don't want to know why it's it's kind of like a brick wall. Um, let's see. That was quarter MOA per tick PET carbon fiber, and then the nylon is the, the nylon gun was was similar to that. Let me bring up. I'll bring up the nylon. What uh, what barrels are? I mean, I'm just using the basic KAK barrels, um, which I have, which which normally in in a normal AR I should be able, I can shoot like a consistently shoot like a three MOA group with with I'm with the ammunition. I'm thinking about. I'm actually thinking about the chambering. If like a, a two two three wild chamber wouldn't possibly help you out in, I, it's just the way at all of these things though seems to me like these would be two MOA problems, which would definitely, of course, add to it. However, I I it seems like I must so, have a I've got to have a bigger problem here to be causing this. I, I'm much with difference. you. See what I mean? Yeah. It's there's got to be there should be something glaring and obvious for that yeah. much. This is more than simple stacking tolerance issues. Yeah, um, so 3D Arm says if a single barrel mount profile was specified, the mount could extend further forward and still match tightly to allow for more angular rigidity. This actually came up during uh, beta testing, and the problem the problem was that barrel mounts beyond the point where I'm currently engaging is that the, with the barrel, there is no standard. So you'd have to use a very specific barrel from a manufacturer, and, and it would have to not change. So yeah, that extending out further could help, but I'm trying to I'm just trying to think yeah, what's causing what's causing the um what's causing the shifting? Is it the plastic flexing or is it mechanical movement? Once I have it epoxy bedded, I don't see how there could be much mechanical movement there. I mean, it's pretty solid. There could be. It some... is possible. It is possible to epoxy bed the bolt. It's risky, but I do it on my bolt actions. Epoxy bed the bolt into what though? Into the plastic receiver. Like the entire bolt carrier group, yeah, so, bud. That would be so. Once again, though, get... it comes back to the the you're bedding it into a plastic part, and that plastic part is flexing as well. So yeah, yeah, I see what you mean because the bolt carrier there is there is so actually okay. So this is this is interesting you brought this up because on the PET carbon fiber with the group we just looked at, the bolt carrier is very tight fitting. It's actually got a bit of friction to it. Uh, and that's because I printed on a 0.6 nozzle and I had some slight issues with the print, but it, it, and it works fine. The bolt does not have any any looseness to it. How and and the and the grouping is still the same, you know, eight, six MOA plus two MOA shift on my PA6 carbon fiber orca, which is the group we're looking at right here, which is a tiny bit bigger. Um the um the bolt carry group is much looser. But it's also made for the more flexible nylon, and I account the larger group to the more flexible nylon. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it could have something to do with the the bolt moving around. I, I don't. It's, it's got to be a big thing. It's got to be something large in my mind that's causing this much. Shift. You're always drawn to the barrel nut. That's the most obvious issue. But you've you've kind of epoxy bedded that to to resolve that. So yeah, that epoxy- leads me back. That's why I'm thinking it's got to be flexibility that's why i went i tried pet carbon fiber which is significantly stiffer and it just didn't cause it did not create a big improvement which is interesting i another thing i need to try and i tried using optics with a larger so right now i've been doing these testing with a small optic mounted on the kind of the towards the rear of the rail which does talk about that which does allow for a larger amount of the entire receiver flexing however i have done testing in the past um earlier on with a uh, LPVO, which had a big long rail, which clamped over pretty much the entire rail, and it didn't change anything. So I feel like I should revisit that and try to put a rail over the entire thing to try to mm-hmm. tile that together, which people have suggested, in which I, I mean, I, at this point, I need to try that and just see what does it change. That's all well, I think and, of at this point. And some of the earlier designs we did in 37 millimeter actually had uh, channels inside of the frame to have press rods. So we'd press like, we'd have like a three millimeter um, hole all the way through the receiver. And we would actually press a three millimeter rod all the way in to add rigidity and strength. That actually is not a bad idea. Um, the challenge is finding space to put the rod, but on, on the upper, I think it would be possible. Yeah. So you could totally do that through like your um, through your Picatinny rail. 
So you could have a three millimeter hole that's going all the way down mm -hmm. the length of that. And you, you have to make sure you have a, a an air hole in the back so you don't uh, airlock it, pneumatically lock it. Yeah. And then you can actually drive a rail all the way down the top of the receiver. There's might... plenty of there's plenty of room. That's that's worth that's worth trying if I can uh yeah, that's worth trying to see if it would help there. Because it's gotta be something like that. There's gotta be flex there. So as far as I see it, there's three areas for gross error. Um, A, the barrel mount shifting. B flex in the uh flex in the upper receiver between the optic and the barrel mount region and C um shifting between the on the Picatinny rail actually at the optic mount. That's the third point. Looking at them, I don't see any signs of shifting at the optic rail, but it's still a possibility I haven't actually investigated. So it might be worth designing a custom mount. So get rid of the Picatinny rail altogether and design a custom mount that would attach directly to the optic. And then bed the optic to the firearm directly to rule that out. That's another option which I've considered doing um, to try to to try to just rule that out as a possibility. Yeah, all that makes sense to me. One thing at a time, and that those are good ideas to try. I think. Yeah. So I just that's really all I'm at right now. It's it's, it's like it's got to be like one of those three things. And which one am I? What am I missing? Is kind of what I'm asking myself. Um. But yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 uh, it's been interesting because the groups have not really improved with all the stuff I've tried. I mean, they, they, we've we've eliminated the shifting issue to to a, to a large extent, but it's still it's still the groups are still six MOA plus. And I my kind of my goal is four MOA. Like that's what I want to see. Four MOA I feel is. Is, is super usable is, rifle. Yeah, exactly. Six MOA is, as I said, marginal. You can still hit stuff. Um, it's still, but it's like kind of like a, a like a PCC type level of accuracy. I feel like if four MOA gets you into the region where you now have a basic rifle. You can hit stuff at three hundred yards. Um, center of mass, just if 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 needed. Um, you know, three hundred yards and in. But six MOA is just a little bit bigger than I want. Yeah. But yeah, that all makes sense. But yeah, so that's really about it for today, guys. I think we've gotten, we've two gone two and a half hours. We've gone classic Hoffman stream style. I've gone uh, much further than I expected. The time really goes by quickly, I have to say. Um, but yeah, that I think kind of covers everything. If anybody else has any really good comments they want to make, you have a just a question for Mr. Snow right now in the next 60 seconds, put it in the chat and we will address it to him for the 70 some people who have, who have, actually held with us this entire time that's pretty that's good, guys. crazy that's uh, insane so we have someone out there interested in some esoteric reloading and, and airship stuff uh or they're just they're just living through the they're living through the airship stuff for the reloading content uh, <laughs> so yes well, i'm living hat, through the rest of the stream best hats and th 600 mike asks will you be doing will mr snow be doing ammo loading videos the problem I see, uh, it's going to be hard to get views on those because there's only there's a few people who are really into it. And there's a lot of really good videos out there already. I don't know that I'm going to add a whole lot to that space, especially with the kind of stuff that I'm doing. Like, it just isn't for your average reloader. Like, um, I'm doing dumb stuff. So, yeah, um, I don't know. Seems to be a little bit of interest, but yeah, it's pretty esoteric i will say but yeah so we've kind of just touched on a bunch of random subjects that was my intention for today's stream i i didn't have an intention to get out here and educate you guys on some particular thing today i just kind of wanted to have a conversation with mr snow that was kind of the idea here uh we didn't even touch on the high speed stuff at all actually uh, uh it's true well we're gonna right. get a chance to do some of that at yeah. uh, the iv88 shoot that so we're coming up on i was and i was gonna ask you about that after the stream here and you just said that, that now i'm super excited actually because i We'll talk about that in 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 a, in a second, but yeah, we, I think we'll be able to do some cool content on that. Um, and TX teacher Mike says, uh, but you go to such detail for the custom thing; it's much more like uh, it's more like enjoying precision work. Um, yeah, I, I do feel precision, like precision work is boring. It's yeah. not great content. It's just not. If you like, really, if you do the Instagram real like metalworking guy style, if I don't know, and you might be able to make it presentable, but it's it's not something that's easy to do. Yeah. And and there's a level of concentration there that is really hard to like film and do yep. precision work. That's just it, it's right just, there. 
it's it's See, very, I, the people who do it i'm like okay that's impressive but that's that's not for me uh for sure Red Horse Veteran says, Mr. Snow, have you seen the new Infinity Bullet Seating Die from SAC? I'm not familiar with that one, but I will check it out now. Infinity Bullet Seating Die from SAC. Yeah, I haven't heard that either. Um, but yeah. So most says, of my stuff comes from Manson Precision. Manson, uh, Manson Precision, Precision Reamers. That's who I get most of my stuff from. Interesting. Um, but yeah, that seems like a pretty esoteric. I would like to get into more long-range shooting, like maybe one MOA would be what I'd be interested in doing. Like, like at most I thought about it. Um, but you know, I, I getting one of those bolt action uppers that they make that goes like PSR has one. I've got the company, but they make a bolt action that drops onto your LR 308 lower. I thought about getting one of those, um, you know, just kind of playing around with it more of the shooting side than the making side. Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, if you're going to go that route, buy yourself a Bagara rifle, you know, buy one of those H uh, B14 Bagaras. They're like, you know, 800 to a thousand dollars. Then you're going to put some decent glass on it and yep. you've got a one MOA rifle. But right I, want, that. I want it to be printed. Fair. So, That's um, fair. And THC Turner Mike, I, he has some, he has some EDM videos that you need to check out. So after the, well, tomorrow, when I have a chance, I will check out some of his videos to see what I can learn. Uh, what you're saying? I want to do. I want to do more 3D printed bolt actions. That's on my to-do list. Yes, exactly. I want precision yeah. with 3D printing. Like it has to be there. It's been elusive, but I, I think we can do something there. So that's yeah. I've got of... some ideas revolving around like you know, it's not exactly 3D printed, but it's more 3D printed jigs to yeah. make stuff that works with metal screwed in parts and pipes. Yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so much stuff guys that can be tried, um, that, uh, we, we, we really, as long as we keep at it, there's like an unlimited number of projects that need to be done. So if anybody's interested in getting into design work, check out some of our previous CAD streams. And, uh, I, I encourage you guys get into doing development. It, there's a lot of potential here. It's a very new space and there's room for a huge number of people to get into actually producing stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty interesting time to be alive, especially in this space. So yeah, there's definitely get involved if you are not already. Um, and with that, do you have any last words, Mr. Snow? Around that idea of picking up new skills, what I always tell people to quote uh, Seneca, Roman, I'm going to destroy this quote a little bit. It says, others will refer to you as lucky if you have the if you have the combined set of skills, when skill meets opportunity, people will call you lucky. That's it. When when skills meet opportunity, others will call you lucky. So build as many skills as you can so that when opportunities rise, others will look at you and say how lucky you are. Yep. Well said. Thank you everybody for watching, especially on this particularly long and probably boring stream. I don't I hope we did a good job. I thought it was interesting, but some of you guys I was entertained. <laughs> Some of you guys might have uh, might have lost you know lost where we were going there. I don't know if, if you're interested in airships. That's that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody who's held with us for this week's stream. I am doing a weekly stream on Thursdays, uh, so I'm trying to get on mostly more CAD stuff, which is what we've been doing. But be sure to tune in next time. Thank you everybody who was watching. Thank you guys for the great comments in there. And um, yeah, that's about it. Have a great great uh, evening or night. <laughs>